Hi, I'm Andrew Torres, and this is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Step aside. Welcome to this special edition clean cut episode of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History podcast. Today is Thursday, July 20th, 2017. My name is Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. We have so much to get to today. As per our MO with the clean cut episodes, this is going to be a little bit longer than the regular episodes. So to give you a brief overview before we jump in, this episode is part one of a two-week primer leading up to the Sunstone Symposium in Salt Lake City from July 26th to the 29th. Cody Nakoni and I are doing a presentation about the Joseph Smith entheogen theory titled Revelation Through Hallucination, and that's going to be at 1015 in the Panorama East Room, and you can find tickets available online at sunstonemagazine.com. And then on Saturday evening, that's the 29th, Marie and I will be doing a live show of my Book of Mormon podcast at Squatter's Pub. Entry is free with a suggested $5 donation. So these next couple of weeks are very busy, which is why we are suspending the historical timeline and all other show segments to just focus on Sunstone for this as well as next week. At the beginning of this episode, you're going to hear a brief conversation that I had with Dan Weiss about his completed Book of Mormon comparative project. Of course, patrons get access to the entire conversation as it went a little bit longer than expected. Moving on from that, the second portion of today's episode will be part one of Cody and I reading through our research paper that we'll be passing out at Sunstone. We'll end the episode with discussing the Patreon pledge drive and an exciting announcement about something that Marie and I plan on doing after the live show while we are in Salt Lake City. With that, let's get into the episode, beginning with my conversation with Dan Weiss. Back in August of 2015, the Brighamite Church made a rare joint decision along with the Community of Christ to release the publish and publish the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon, as well as um, Royal Skousen did a bunch of work in publishing the uh, actual original manuscript from which the Book of Mormon was derived. Well, since then, there have been... uh, cobbling of together of scholars and historians who are getting together and analyzing what this printer's manuscript is and trying to compare it to the current day Book of Mormon. It just so happens last summer, I teamed up with a guy named Dan Weiss, and who was in the process of making a Book of Mormon comparative, combining the original manuscript and the printer's manuscript together and then comparing it to the 2013 edition of the Book of Mormon, which is the most recent edition. We launched a Kickstarter to try and get the the website funded with the realbookofmormon.org. Unfortunately, the Kickstarter was not successful, but as we said in the video, we will persevere and we will get the project done, and that is exactly what has happened. So today I've invited on Dan Weiss, my good friend and collaborator on the realbookofmormon.org, to discuss his project and what his accomplishment is. Dan, thank you for joining me today. Hi, Bryce. It's good to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming back. It's been some uh, some time since I've had you on the podcast, and last time we just discussed what the uh, the concept was behind the project. But do you mind telling us now that the project is, well, officially completed, what, what have you done? What have you been pouring all of your hours into to get uh, completed? 
Well, uh, what it is is a, a, a comparison between uh, the coalesced original manuscript and the printer's manuscript and uh, comparing, the, comparing that side by side with the currently published version of the Book of Mormon on LDS.org, which is uh, uh, the 2013 uh, edition, the, which is the latest revision that they have of uh, the Book of Mormon at this point. And the, uh, what I've done is I've taken in a format and made, uh, in coalescing the two original manuscripts, I have all of the... Uh, I have all of the text of the printer's manuscript in black ink, which is almost a hundred percent extant. It's, uh, I mean, it's beautiful. As you just mentioned, it's the reorganized Church Community of Christ uh, has the rights to it, and they preserved it very well. Uh, Joseph mm-hmm. Smith was not so good with the original manuscript, and. Uh, <laughs> buried it as a time capsule, basically, and the church realized later, wow, this is, this is valuable. We really ought to pull this thing out. And it was pretty much a bundle of, uh, paper that sandwiched together and, uh, and they were only able to get about 28% of the original manuscript transcribed. Any of the original manuscript, in my opinion, and I think most, most people that uh, are interested in authenticity would say that that should have priority over the printer's manuscript since the printer's manuscript was essentially Oliver Cowdery and a few others just hand copying the original manuscript over. So in with the original manuscript, we have all of the text that's in blue. So about 28% of the since the since the original manuscript trumps the printer's manuscript there's about 28% of this one column of the coalesced uh book of mormon in blue ink uh, with the remainder of it the lion share of it in black ink and then on the opposite side in the other column you have the church's current version and every change or difference uh, that's been made in it, uh, is identified in red ink in some way. Some are like spacers, spaces are, uh, identified with an underscore. Uh, if a comma uh, was added, well, a real comma is put there. A large amount of the differences are, uh, ampersands being changed to and any and every single minute detail I've highlighted in red, uh, so that it's very easy to compare against the original manuscript and the printer's manuscript. So this is a fascinating project, and people can go on to the realbookofmormon.org and go to the Book of Mormon comparative and see this in front of them, a chapter-by-chapter comparison of the original and printer's manuscript to the 2013. So this is essentially just an online version of the book that you are are putting together and um, you're, you're printing up right now. And uh, you're nice enough to give me a copy of the actual full-on Book of Mormon comparative. Uh, when I contacted you last, uh, God, it was, it was sometime uh, like the spring or summer of 2016, uh, you gave me one of your copies of the volume one, which was first Nephi to Alma 35. But now I do have the entire volume of the Book of Mormon comparative. And it is a fascinating and beautiful book to see the entire Book of Mormon compared to the original and printer's manuscripts. Now, people may ask, and this might be a rehashing for longtime listeners, but I want to get your current take on it. Now that you have completed the project and you're at this state what is the entire point behind what you're doing here? Why is it necessary to look at these comparisons and highlight all of the differences? And and before answering, I will say I, I saw that you calculated out a rough estimate of like 106,000 changes that have been made over the entire Book of Mormon. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, but why is it relevant? Why is it important that they've changed the the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon? Well – 
there's definitely a couple of different ways to look at it, a couple of different perspectives. From the skeptical side, from my now uh, apostate self, I take a look at it and say that the most important thing was uh, how much... Uh, how much value the church has always put in this idea uh, and backed up the notion that Joseph Smith said that it was the most correct book. Uh, and and so for me, when you look at it as a, a skeptic, it's valuable to note that if this was the most correct book ever written, then there are a lot of books that went through major editing uh, processes like no other that we have no idea of how uh, how horrible of a, an edit had to be done. The fact of the matter is is that that the entire text from front to back of the original uh, printer's manuscript is plagued with bad grammar, punctuation, and uh, there are some very glaring examples also of of uh, things that affect doctrinal concepts in the church. And so for me, I would say that's the the overriding idea behind it. It, it is to point out the fact that this holy book that uh, the Mormons praise so much is really not as wonderful as it is made out to be. The other perspective, though, is that I also believe it's important to hold the church's hands to the fire when it comes to transparency regarding these issues. Now, of course, the printer's manuscript and the transcription of the original manuscript, they have been available for years but never, never in a comparative way in the same manner that I've, that I've done it. I think that, uh, uh, that I've had some pushback from a active Mormons that feel that it is kind of a finger pointing issue that I'm doing by pointing out what the changes are in the Book of Mormon or the differences are in there. I look at it as just being able to say, uh, seriously, have you taken a look at the original manuscripts, and have you compared them to what yeah. the uh, what the current version is? In fact, uh, as I began the project uh, in its infancy, I was perhaps just in my early twenties when I had uh, uh, discovered the uh, 1830 version of the Book of Mormon. And at that point, I, I was a very active member of the church. I went through and began doing, in a very minor way, uh, cataloging the differences between the uh, 1830 version and the then 1977 version of the Book of Mormon that I had. This was just a continuation. When the when the church released the Joseph Smith Papers and had this had these beautiful volumes uh, that that actually have scanned photographs of the printer's manuscript, I was just captivated. I was elated and decided, wow, now we have access to computers, we have these beautiful manuscripts, now's the time to do the big project. And so <laughs> I, uh, I decided to take the whole thing on. Wow. Nicely said. So I have to ask, I have a copy of the Book of Mormon comparative, uh, but you did tell me when you gave it to me as a gift that this is a bit of an exclusive gift and it is signed. And for that, I do dearly thank you. But I want to ask for the listeners out there, where might they be able to pick up a copy of this at a fine retailer near them? Right now, the best thing that I can offer is... Uh, is to be able to to look at realbookofmormon.org and get the information uh, directly from the website. I have made a few copies of this and have found that the personal expense of doing e even small production runs is astronomical. Even when I've been trying to get best estimates, uh, let's say I've uh, got an estimate from... Um, 
FedEx office today for printing a hundred copies. Now this is just printing paper and ink. That's it. No binding, no ribbon marker, no covers, nothing, but just the printing itself. One hundred copies, uh, fifty nine dollars per copy just for the printing. Ooh. So, uh, wow. so I'm doing research in order to try to find, uh, uh, for far more economical ways to do it on my own, but it's very, very spendy. And, and right now the copies that I'm generating are to be used in ways to help promote it, uh, or to very close, uh, very close family members or friends. Those are the only things, uh, that are really available. I would like to, okay. I would like to add though that I, uh, I have, uh, I have some feelers out for getting it published, uh, and, uh, I'm having to be very patient about it, uh, as well as other people that know about the project, uh, are being very patient as well, uh, to try to get copies in their hands. So it's, not going very fast. I, I, I would uh, almost beg of anybody that has a, uh, any influence to maybe give me a hand in seeing this thing get published. We can just say that the book is in prototype phase at the moment. You know, it's it's getting ready to pitch to publishers. Hopefully, you have physical copies, but obviously, they cost you just in printing costs alone sixty dollars to print per book, and then the binding and everything on top of that, and that doesn't include any promotion or anything to that effect. So, that's kind of the problem with projects like this. They always take more than they can ever get back. I mean. You and I both have copies of the Dan Vogel History of the Church, the Source and Text Critical Edition, and we each paid around $1,000 for that because, you know, these are projects that take years. You know, Dan, you said it yourself, you've put, you know, 1,500 some odd man hours into this just as a sole person, as a sole uh, worker in this. And that's the problem, you know, scholars and historians need to be paid for their time. So, you know, just say... Maybe somebody listening says, hey, you know what? I don't care what the cost is. I need to have a copy of that book. Is there some way that they can get in touch with you or that they can, you know, find out what it might uh, cost? Or, you know, if somebody does have connections to publishing firms that might be interested in a scholarly work like this, where can they get in touch with you? Well, uh, first of all, I have to say nothing gives me greater joy right now than to be able to hand over a copy of the printed book to someone. So I, I love that. I'm, I yearn for the day when uh, it can be freely available to everyone. So uh, I'm, I'm open to, I'm open to making copies if, uh, if, if the price is right and negotiated properly, but it's, it's, I, I really have to say my printing costs for just doing a, a, the, the printing and binding and getting the, getting in the format that you're holding right now, a bookstore usually has like a 40% markup on it. You'd be paying well over $200 mm -hmm. for a book in order to, uh, to get this book in your hands, uh, with the, I mean, just the basic, home printing on a laser printer or inkjet printer that uh that i can do it's it's just very very expensive uh so yeah it, but hey yeah, that books no, are not and cheap. and the fact that every Definitely. one of these pages uh has color on it is 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 an additional yeah. expense now having said that i know that there's ways uh to fedex office is not the the end all place to try to get something printed um and so i know i can get the price down significantly obviously the church put out these volumes uh with the printer's manuscripts and they were charging somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 dollars per book for them and uh the amount of ink mm -hmm. and everything that's that uh. it took in order to pr produce those way ex exceeds what uh what mine uh would cost so i know there's a way to get the price down and uh um like i said i've got I've got some feelers out for uh, a publisher but uh no firm bites at this point and uh so i'm 
uh, I'm eager for something to happen that way. Very cool. So where is it that, you know, if anybody has a possible lead that they can toss your way or they just want to talk to you about the project, uh, do you have an email address or some contact information that you can put out there that people can get in touch with you? Yes, they uh, they can uh, send me an email at dan, D-A-N, at APSSLC.com. That's dan at APSSLC.com. Very cool. And then also, if I'm not mistaken, you're going to be at Sunstone here in a week. Um, and, you know, maybe there might even be some listeners there who would uh, be interested to see a copy of the book if you, uh, you know, they, they may want to uh, behold an actual physical copy in front of them just to see the gravity of this work, because it really doesn't hit you until you have one of these books in your hands. Uh, so I I guess we'll, I, I hope that we'll be seeing people at Sunstone and that people uh, listening here will be interested in what you, you have put together, because really, from my own perspective, it is quite an impressive work. And I just have to say thank you so much, Dan, for devoting so many, uh, so many hours to this project. And this is just a huge, huge deal. And I'm so stoked that you have gotten it to the stage it's at in this prototype phase. It's just amazing to hold this book in my hands and see it for myself. So, Dan, thank you for your collaboration on the Real Book of Mormon.org, and thank you for doing what you do. It's been a pleasure from start to finish. I, I do have to say there is a little, uh, there's a little bit of uh, irony here in the fact that I, I'm kind of a late bloomer when it comes to your podcast, <laughs> and I've been going back and uh, listening to past episodes, and there's hints that you are making before we even met. There were there are these uh, hints about almost as if you were begging for this work that I accomplished to be done. Absolutely. And I, I listen to these podcasts and I go, wow, it's, it's no wonder this, uh, was so impactful to Bryce because he, he was almost, was almost challenging someone to do it. And, uh, <laughs> It's funny that I found all of that out in hindsight. Well, uh, you, so I'm glad that somebody picked up on those signals at some point, and I have a feeling like I'm not the only person that's hungry to see this information out there and widely publicized. So um, hopefully this this uh, little bit that we've been discussing, this project, leads somewhere good for everybody. And um, Dan, once again, thank you for what you do, and thanks for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bryce. All right, that's going to do it for the conversation with Dan. Please check out realbookofmormon.org to see his work there, as well as the Defector of the Faith portal with the 1001 facts about Mormonism that are challenging to believe. As said in the interview, Dan will be attending Sunstone, so look around for the friendly guy with a big white beard, and be sure to ask him about the project. He loves to talk about it. Obviously, you heard him. We both love to talk to each other about this. So now on to the main segment for today. This is my discussion with Cody Nakoni, my research partner on the Smith Entheogen Theory, as well as the host of the Silly Rabbits podcast. That's P-S-I-L-L-Y. Without further ado, here it is. As many of you know who listen to this podcast, I've been working on a paper for quite some time with a research partner, and the paper discusses, uh, well, it's a discourse on the Smith entheogen theory, the historical model wherein it claims that Joseph Smith was frequently using entheogens. Of course, this is a fairly undiscussed topic in Mormon history, but we think that it has some profound implications and it may possibly be quite documentable and uh, provable in a historical sense. But of course, I cannot talk about this without inviting on my research partner and the host of the Silly Rabbits podcast, Cody Nakoni. Cody, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me on again. It's been fun uh, working with you for the last few months. Likewise, and it has been, uh, this has been our church for the last uh, about seven, eight months now. I mean, every Sunday we've had a meeting where we discuss the evolution of this paper. It has been a long time coming, and now it is within a couple weeks from Sunstone, and 
you know, I, I had this thought occur to me that not everybody who listens to either of our podcasts is going to want to read through a 30 page historically dense document. Um, but a lot of people will want to listen to our kind of, um, our take on it as well as our commentary as we read it, because, you know, this amount of information is much easier to consume in audio format. So that's what we're doing today. We're going to basically read through our paper and expand on some of the points that we, we think deserve expansion, but don't actually make it into the paper. And we're actually going to do this in a two-part series. The first part will be covering the uh, pre-history uh, use of entheogens, as well as the uh, entheogens throughout documented history. And then that's going to lead us up into the Enlightenment and then into the Joseph Smith worldview. And then part two is going to focus on nothing but Mormonism. So everybody listening, this is a two-part very heavy couple of episodes, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this. So, Cody, because you have a lot more um, knowledge in this field, and this is what your podcast focuses around, can we walk a little bit around the prehistory of entheogen use and the entheogen use through history to kind of give us a primer to this, uh, and to the entire paper that we've put together? Certainly. Um, would you like to uh, maybe break down some of the, the vocabulary we'll be using first, or should I? Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's jump into some of the vocabulary, and I think the most important word to define would be entheogen. What is your take on what an entheogen is? Uh, entheogen is a word that was proposed by uh, a few scholars uh, that wrote a book in the ni late 1970s, it was uh, Dr. Wasson, uh, Carl Ruck, and Jonathan Ott. Um, they were trying to expand upon the word psychedelic, which they didn't feel fit um, the overall mystical experience that uh, people often report. Yeah, and psychedelic definitely has a stigma attached that it sounds like they're trying to disconnect themselves from the tie-dye hippie type of, uh, you know, experimentation. They're trying to say there's, there's a lot of science to be done on these, these chemicals, these plant medicines. We need a specific term that encapsulates a little bit more of what they really are. So can you kind of give us an uh, a little bit of an etymology on entheogen because we see theo in that word as in like a theology or a connection or, you know, something relating to God. Uh, how exactly does entheogen mean that? Um, it means that it, uh, actually I can bring up the, uh, it's broken. Uh, Karl Ruck is a, uh, Greek classicist. So the, the word entheogen is, uh, his breakdown uh, in Greek, which I think means something to the effect of uh, uh, generating God or generating the divine within, uh, something to that effect. In our conversations, you've kind of, uh, you've made it very clear that there are endogenous and exogenous sources of entheogens. I mean, people can attain an altered state of consciousness through things other than what we might consider like a plant medicine or something that you would ingest. And that would be a, more of an endogenous uh, induction of this entheogenic experience. So what, what are some examples of that, uh, you know, ways to get into that altered state of consciousness without eating a bunch of really nasty tasting mushrooms? <laughs> um, probably one of the easiest and most accessible methods for people is, uh, uh, holotropic breath work, uh, which was introduced by Stanislav Grof. Um, you can find some okay. uh, tutorial videos on YouTube, but uh, you basically, um, through very uh, specific uh, rhythmic um, hyperventilation, if you will, you, you basically um, hyperventilate yourself into a, a state like this. Um, and if you're familiar with the, the ice man, his name is Wim Hof. Uh, he like swims under ice and he like buries him. So he like has a bunch of world records. Um, yeah. And he's like, he, didn't he like do a marathon in the desert without any water and stuff like that too? Is that yeah, the same guy? And he, yeah. And he like climbed Mount Everest in a t-shirt without a t-shirt in like shorts and he did it with no oxygen. 
Um, <laughs> that's crazy. So, this, so, um, but that's his method, and he claims that uh, he can reach like full blown five MeO DMT states uh, just by breathing his way there. And okay, so it, 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 people listening to Naked Mormonism probably don't have as much exposure to what exactly that is. What what is this invocation of a word five MeO DMT? Um, level. What what exactly <laughs> is that? If you could try and define that for us. Uh, thank you. Um, 5-MeO DMT is one of the most uh, potent uh, visionary hallucinogens that we know of, um, and it consistently elicits this experience of theophany, um, almost regardless of <laughs> what the dose uh, or what the set and setting is, uh, which we'll we'll explain a little bit more uh, about in just a second, uh, but. Um, a, DM, a 5-MeO DMT is uh, most regularly found in high concentrations in the Bufo toad, uh, Bufo alvear, so the um, Sonoran Desert toad. Uh, so the, that's where you get the, the legend of licking toads. Aha! Well, that's fascinating. But DMT is, uh, I know there's been this uh, kind of a, I guess you can call it a documentary called The the Spirit Molecule, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And that's all about DMT. And I, I swear that um, Roland Griffiths was featured in that, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was – okay. Um, and it's essentially – it's the active ingredient in ayahuasca. Is that correct? Uh, some some forms of it. Uh, DMT is actually broken up into two, two uh, main uh, molecules. There's NN-dimethyltryptamine, which is supposed to be a lot more visionary, but um, – uh, it's it's a little weaker, um, and that's more commonly found in in ayahuasca uh, and a lot of the admixture plants. But five uh, meo DMT is a much more potent variety. That I mean, you can you can get five five meo from uh, certain uh, ingredients in ayahuasca, but its main constituent would be NN dimethyltryptamine. Interesting. Okay, so we're kind of getting into the weeds on, on the, the <laughs> yes. chemical substances, but this is this is important because it's setting out the groundwork because it's not like these are, uh, you know, our current modern day interpretation of these things that are, you know, previously known as psychedelics, but we call entheogens now. We, we have kind of a clinical per, uh, perspective of it. You know, you take a tab of acid or like a little, you know, a mint with a drop of acid on it or something. And that's, that's, uh, lysergic acid, LSD. Um, or you, you take some, some, uh, dried up mushrooms and eat those, whatever. But like, it, we, the way that I perceived this before we began our research is there are just a few of these things out there that, you know, people occasionally experiment with and whatever, more power to them. But the more that we've been working together in this and the more I've been listening to your podcast, the more I realize these things are everywhere. I mean, there are tons of entheogens, uh, just abundantly available that don't even make it onto any schedule drug list. I mean, most of like the, the witching herbs uh, or the hexing herbs that they're, they don't make it onto the actual, uh, you know, like the, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the ban list by the, the, the Controlled uh, Substances Act. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was just stumbling over words, but yeah, I mean, it, there, there are certain things that, uh, that exist out there and, and, you know, Part of our paper is centered around Datura, uh, and it's it's everywhere around where Joseph Smith lived. It's it's known as Jimson weed or Jamestown weed up there because it's just so frequently. It's just known as a weed, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly psychoactive. So <laughs> these things are everywhere. You just have to know what the plants look like and know how to work them, know how to refine them. Well, that's a, it's a bit of a gray area. That's where things get a little hairy. Uh, the plants themselves are not generally illegal, but uh, extracting uh, substances out of them, like say, um, I believe scopolamine is on the, the uh, scheduled substances, uh, but Datura is not. So if you were to extract scopolamine from Datura, then you'd have a problem uh, legally. Interesting. Okay, so the okay, this is just even more foundation. Okay, but the the point that we're getting at is all of these these materials, these plant medicines and whatnot, they are used to uh to elicit an altered state of consciousness, to create a, a different state of mind in whoever imbibes them from an exogenous source. So can we kind of define what that altered state of consciousness is or define 
what it means to be in an altered state of consciousness, as well as what we would consider the threshold for theophany. Okay, um, so theophany is the, the, the state of consciousness we're referring to, where an individual experiences a, a meeting or communication with deity, or a, a mystical experience, or some type of like spiritual uh, enlightenment. And um, this is elicited through a very synergistic relationship of dose set and setting uh dose okay. being dose being the uh amount you take uh you can take too much so that's a that's a b- important factor and you can take too little so you really have to know how much it takes to elicit this type of experience and this changes wildly depending on what chemical you're ingesting so um education 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 <laughs> <laughs> Be very careful in experimentation out there. Yes, if you're thinking about doing so, please check out uh, websites like uh, maps.org or um, arrowid.com, um, or I believe it's arrowid.org. Uh, but they, they're they great uh, resources for really um, doing some preliminary research and finding it out exactly what it is you want to do and how much of it. Um, anyway, back to uh, set and setting are the other parts of that uh, tripod I was referring to. Uh, set being your mindset or like your intention going in there's you can kind of uh, play with intention a little bit but generally you need to have at least some intention of having this type of experience for it to work otherwise you're just like taking a party drug and getting high with your friends which is fine no judgment but um in order to elicit this type of uh, spiritual or mystical experience there has to be intent that's a very important uh, variable so Set up for us what a set and setting is in difference between a recreational taking versus a spiritual or mystical application of, of entheogens. You know, uh, you, like you said, with a party with your friends, that would be like a recreational type of thing. P- friends getting together, watching a stupid show and, and eating mushrooms or whatever. Like that's, that's a party set and setting. And, you know, it's not really expected that you would attain actual theophany, that connection to God in that experience. But what would be a mystical type of set and setting where a theophany is more likely? Um, well, this uh, this is probably best highlighted by the uh, miracle of Marsh Chapel or the Good Friday experiment, uh, mm-hmm. where a uh, number of theology students were administered psilocybin in a uh, in a church, uh, I believe, on the uh, Harvard campus. They, after singing some hymns and uh, listening to some uh, inspirational sermons. Uh, they all immediately <laughs> began to have very powerful and uh, meaningful mystical experiences. And uh, the the difference being, uh, I mean, the same friends that watched a movie uh, and took mushrooms could probably do it in a church and uh, still have a lot of fun and giggle. And somebody might have uh, a moment of uh, mystical or spiritual uh, enlightenment, but Generally, you have to have all three variables really honed in, and uh, the miracle of Marsh Chapel or the Good Friday experiment uh, was uh, clinically observed. It, it was a double blind. Well, it was meant to be a double blind study, but <laughs> the observers quickly <laughs> realized that it was a uh, the, the niacin that they'd given the uh, the other ten participants uh, was not nearly as noticeable as the psilocybin. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think they they also, uh, it, if I'm not mistaken, they also gave them the option that you know afterwards, if you wanted to to actually try the psilocybin, uh, the people that were given the control uh, dose of niacin, uh, they could come back like a month later and try the psilocybin, and all of them were like, yeah, that was definitely not what I experienced <laughs> before. So um, it's actually, very profound. That's a, yeah, that's a, you're, you're referring to the uh, the study that Roland Griffiths did in 2002, where they uh, they replicated oh, okay. this experiment. Uh, under more controlled uh, settings, and then they did. Uh, they've done some subsequent uh, uh, verifications of the same uh, study, and in that in that particular study, they allowed people to come back and take psilocybin. Uh, but at the Miracle of Marsh Chapel, they they did not. So this is. <laughs> A lot of the audience of Naked Mormonism, at least, are very skeptically minded, and uh, to those 
who listen to this who have never imbibed in any of these chemicals before and have never um, felt any of the, that spiritual or mystical connection that way. The, the, I can imagine that their skeptic radar is flashing, but this is something that is a bit of an ineffable experience. It's really hard to describe, and that's the word what, what the word theophany is, where – you can't describe what it is that you're seeing, feeling, and what what is going through your mind. And any time you try and describe it, it just comes out as word salad because your mind is just running faster than your mouth can possibly comprehend. And there's – you just have a profound – uh, chemical experience happening in your mind that is uh, just indescribable. And that is what this word theophany tries to, tries to, uh, define. Mm -hmm. Well, and to be fair, we, we only, we can only communicate with small mouth noises and they can only mm -hmm. do so much justice to an experience that is entirely visionary and, uh, and incorporates so many of your senses and often uh, mixes them in, in synesthetic uh, ways. So you, you just like you uh, experience taste as sound or sound as a vision and, and whatnot. So th there's so many little parts of this that you can only, you can only express in one sentence. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that's obviously an altered state of consciousness kind of it casts a really broad net and captures a lot of different versions of what people do to get into an altered state or try and get to where their mind is um, elevated or altered from their everyday baseline, just going about their day-to-day -day lives. And that's kind of the important part that we're hitting on is that the dose set and setting creates the altered state of consciousness that is possible to attain theophany, which is why we're spending so much time describing these terms because they're really loaded terms and they're paramount to understanding this discussion as well as the paper that we have written here. Well, and, and for all the skeptics that you were, you were talking about, the, the, the real importance of dose set and setting is the statistical reliability of this experience that's what changes this from like four friends in a room partying and maybe one, maybe one of them has an experience for like 10 minutes and then goes off in the bathroom on his own versus putting 10 people in a room dosing all 10 of them and all 10 of them have a full-blown scale of one to five number five experience and okay. and the repeatability of that is what's really important and that's that the repeatability is absolutely dependent on dose set and setting and and possibly hitting and what the focus of the paper on is more so on the the dosage factor because we, when it, you get into larger groups of people it becomes much harder to fine tune the set and setting to a point that a statistically significant number of them can actually attain this altered state of consciousness but when you have a group of you know 500 or 1000 people in a room and you're wanting a bunch of them to get to that five, that one to five scale, you want a, a bunch of them to hit that five and go off, then you have to, you have to control your dose and you have to fine tune your set and setting to a level that's, that requires a lot of practice, right? Mm -hmm. And just for example, like if you went to a, a holotropic breathing clinic, you might be lucky if 20 or 30% of the, the people there experienced something like this uh, versus uh, an experience where you at Marsh Chapel where 100% of them ex experienced uh, theophany. And then again, this uh, experiment was repeated by Roland Griffiths a number of times and the, the guys over at John Hopkins Medical or the men and women over at John Hopkins Medical. So okay. um, repeatability, <laughs> it's, it's very repeatable. Yeah, especially in a statistically large groups of people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, like you said, with four friends in a group or, you know, like, let's, let's just throw in a, an example from Mormonism in the school of the prophets with like 15 dudes up in this room where they are all imbibing in the sacrament and singing hymns and reading their Bible. Like that's a very controlled and finely tuned dose set and setting. Whereas when you have, you know, 500 or a thousand people in the Kirtland temple, it's much harder to control what each and every one of those people are experiencing. So you have to, you know, up the dose or you have to do something to make it special in order to have a large portion of these people experience um, 
a visionary or to attain a visionary experience and possibly even hallucinate the existence of angels and whatnot. I mean, it's very, uh, yeah, the, the point is repeatability, reliability, and, uh, the, the, uh, predictability of what somebody will see prior to, uh, engaging in the proper dose set and setting. So I think this kind of dovetails well into what the the beginning of our paper because we kind of set this out at the very beginning we define what altered states of consciousness are and what entheogens are but there's a long history that we have of of ritualism in general that possibly might be connected to the use of entheogens and this this dates long before we have even written history. Can we kind of discuss that a little bit and what evidence we have for people using um, plant medicine entheogens to get to this place? Okay. Um, now, <laughs> they, so we can go with uh, the more speculative stuff because they uh, the, the further back in prehistory, obviously, it's a lot more speculation. But um, yeah. uh, the f- the further in we go towards our timeline of uh, like written history of uh, 3,500, 4,000 BCE, um, we start to get some really solid evidence. Um, but as uh, probably the earliest this theory goes is uh, Terence McKenna uh, first postulated that um, the transformation from our ancestors Homo erectus to the spe- uh, to the species Homo sapiens was uh, directly attributed to the uh, addition of hallucinogenic mushrooms in, into our diet. Um, and he put forward that this theory was uh, roughly uh, around 100,000 uh, BCE, or that this took place around then. Um, and his, uh, this had a lot to do with the uh, sudden expansion of our uh, brain cavity and... Um, the formation of things like language and art and, and things that you begin to see uh, in cave paintings and whatnot. Now, he got a lot of flack for this because um, yeah. he, he was... I was going to say, <laughs> there's not exactly a sound archaeological evidence backing this claim up, though, really. No, um, and he was a little loose with um, his paleontological citation, um, and he he didn't... He was working with some really early... Uh, uh, mycology information. So uh, it's a lot of it's changed and gotten a lot more specific since then. So he focused really heavily on uh, one specific mushroom, psilocybe cubensis. But like you said, there's just evidence that this was everywhere and it, it was uh, available in multiple forms, not just psilocybes. There's uh, paniolus mushrooms, there's um, the Amanita muscaria, there's a, a number of uh, varieties that will elicit this type of experience. Another big part of, or, or while this theory needs a lot of work, um, I think it's important to to bring up because it's it's not worth throwing out the the baby with the bathwater. I think um, it just needs to be updated. It needs a lot more research. It needs more people on it, and frankly, it hasn't had a lot of people on it, and so that's why I bring it up. Awesome, and. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he also postulates that essentially the evolution of agriculture was solely for the purpose of having access to these entheogens year round. Because when you have, uh, you know, when you're partaking of certain entheogens that only bloom or fruit at uh, certain times of the year, uh, but you want to, you know, get off in early spring when it's, you know, late in the, or it's, it, it's completely the wrong season to harvest a specific mushroom or a specific, uh, um, fungi or, or something to that effect. Then you have to grow your own, your own, you have to cultivate your own entheogens in a controlled area. And it, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these plants are highly susceptible to seasonal and uh, environmental factors. So yeah. um, really controlling those is, is what they were trying to do, uh, especially with the plants that you like the most, the ones that <laughs> get, you, uh, get you high. Yeah, and that that could possibly have evolved alongside the cultivation of grain and, and other things that were necessary for, you know, staples of life as well as these, these uh, entheogenic substances. Uh, but to qualify or to disqualify Terrence McKenna's stoned ape theory just on the basis that, well, there isn't enough archaeological evidence backing it up. I agree with you. It kind of seems like it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, I will refer people back to episode eight of Silly Rabbit's podcast to get further into that. And we won't belabor the point too much in that case. 
Um, I do want to just hit really quickly on uh, the Red Ochre later, Lady as well as the Iceman. Could we uh, spend two or three minutes talking about those two? Yeah. Aside from uh, like cave paintings and, and art, which deciding whether or not they were they were representing hallucinogens is is highly debatable and it's all speculation. Um, but some of the first real solid evidence for this idea of like a plant based religion or uh, the uh, origin of sacrament, if you will, uh, pops up around twenty thousand BCE uh, with the red ochre lady uh, of El Moron Cave, which was found in Spain, um, okay. just outside of the um, the Alps, I believe. But anyway, she was, uh, researchers have taken plaque filings, uh, from her corpse and have found that, um, there were spores belonging either to agaric or bolate mushrooms. Uh, so she was eating them regularly enough that they're in her plaque uh, and, uh, plaque that's still, uh, ready for analysis, uh, almost 22,000 years later. That's amazing. So for so for reference, uh, agaric species uh, can include hallucinogenic varieties like panioles and psilocybes and uh, the Amanita muscaria, which I mentioned, but they also include a lot of uh, just medicinal and edible mushrooms as well. So that's it's not solid evidence, but it is it is some of the first uh, tangible evidence that we do come across. But she was, I mean, it's also worth pointing out that she was buried ceremonially in this cave. I mean, she was obviously a revered member of her tribe and, you know, probably some kind of spiritual shaman. She was of what we would consider middle age now, but what would be considered an elder back then, you know, in her, uh, what, her mid 40s or something to that effect. So it's likely that she was a spiritual leader, and that's a very loaded term there uh but being buried in a ceremonial fashion and covered in these uh the, this this uh, red ochre in order to to uh basically set her apart from anybody else in the tribe she obviously has some heightened uh status in her tribe and you know if she were <laughs> creating some kind of uh, sacrament or something to that effect and uh, causing the people of her tribe to have these uh, mystical experiences, it might be understood that she would be upheld as a revered spiritual leader in her group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was given a, a particularly prominent position uh, within the cave and the, the little village that she was uh, overlooking. She was essentially undisturbed until she was found. So she remained in this prominent position for some 20,000 years. So it, it, wow. a, a lot of thought and intention went into her burial. Wow, that's amazing. So uh, what about the Iceman? Because they found actual mushrooms on his person, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the Iceman was found in the Italian Alps, uh, not incredibly far away from, from where uh, the Red Ochre Lady was found. And now his, he's been named Otzi, uh, the Iceman. We don't know his name, obviously, but uh, I'll just refer to him as Otzi. Um, the, he, we know he was severely wounded and likely murdered um, approximately uh, 5,500 years ago. Um, there's some new evidence that counters this, but regardless, he was frozen and uh, he was almost perfectly preserved until he was discovered in uh, 91 by some hikers. And yes, they did find under uh, a pool in Southern California. It was uh, <laughs> Brendan Fraser is Otzi. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and the, the researchers were Polly Shore and. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. So uh, anyway, we know we know he was uh, particularly important and likely a shaman or some type of a spiritual worker because he he's a uh, he had this beautiful uh, copper axe which at the time would have been incredibly rare. And um, it had a U handle. U is, off, is a wood that's often association, associated with the world tree or uh, shamanic practices. And um, it was in near pristine condition, which, which means he wasn't using it. And he obviously would have needed to. So it was probably ceremonial. And he was also covered in tattoos which we won't, we don't need to go into, but they were essentially like magic tattoos, or there's evidence to suggest that they were. And on his uh, on his side, he carried a pouch which contained two different types of mushroom. One was probably used for tinder or as like a firekeeper, and the other one um, 
was a conch mushroom that he was likely using as a, a type of antiseptic or um, antiviral um, antibiotic type thing uh, where he'd just make a tea out of it. And it surprisingly effective as such. It's I know it sounds like hippie nonsense that you drink mushroom tea, but um, no. <laughs> it, if that's all you have, um, it, it can be very effective in, in, in uh, doing that. I mean, why did he not go to his local Walgreens and just pick <laughs> up some uh, some Benadryl and you know amoxicillin? I, yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of the point here, right? Is <laughs> like people back then, pharmacies are a very new thing on the grand scheme of things. You know, people back then, people even up until the you know the twentieth century, the mid twentieth century, had to make their own medicine. Uh, based on the roots and plants that they had around them and they had to and just because he only had, there were only two different types of mushrooms in his pouch it didn't mean that those were the only mushrooms he ever ate it's just the ones that they found him with and mm -hmm. it just so happens that you know so one of them was has medicinal qualities so it, it's it's interesting to point out these things that happen before history or concurrent with uh the beginnings of uh written history where people were actually using these things that we that may not have been actual entheogens or hallucinogenic, but they were eating mushrooms, and I don't understand why like certain psilocybe mushrooms or certain you know just an amanita mushroom would be taboo to them, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and just to uh, just to highlight that, I have a quote from uh, uh, a paper entitled "The Origins of Inebriation." Uh, and it says, quote, far from being consumed for hedonistic purposes, uh, drug plants and alcoholic drinks had a sacred role among prehistoric societies. It is not surprising that most of the evidence derives from both elite burials and restricted ceremonial sites like we just talked about, uh, suggesting the possibility that the consumption of mind altering products was socially controlled in prehistoric Europe. That means it was likely controlled by the priest class like uh, Otzi or the, the Red Ochre Lady but that it was not a social taboo. It was uh, widely acceptable and available uh, to probably all members of society. And um, it's important to note that both Otzi and the Red Ochre Lady were just, uh, were although they were like 15,000 years apart in time, they were just only a few hundred miles from each other. Oh, wow. Interesting. And, uh, yeah, and that's only a few hundred miles from the Cave of Forgotten Dreams uh, in France as well. So Exactly. Um, yeah, very interesting. And again, there's some evidence to suggest that uh, those paintings were made while under the influence of hallucinogenic drugs. Yeah, uh, fascinating stuff. Yeah, with the the light deprivation that they had down there, uh, there wasn't much evidence for them using fires and having fires down there, or it was very scarce if they did. But they were able to make these amazing paintings and whatnot, um, possibly in an altered state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, I think we should read the paper because we have a lot to get through here. And like I said, not everybody listening is going to want to read the paper. Uh, so let's use this as an opportunity to basically create an audiobook version of our paper and then add in commentary as we go. So I, I know I have it pulled up here. Do you have it pulled up, Cody? I do, yep. Okay, so let's go ahead and read uh, just right off of the bat. Let's read uh, the thesis and the abstract. Um, I'll start with the thesis. It says, Mormon history is rife with speculation and controversy. We construct the Smith entheogen historical model describing Joseph Smith's frequent use of plant medicine, specifically entheogens, and the impact it had upon many of the early followers of the Mormon movement. And the reason why we spent so much time setting this up is because the first like two or three pages of the paper go lightning quick through what we've just been discussing. And then the rest of the paper is all about Mormonism. So we're going to spend an inordinate amount of time on Mormonism, but we needed some foundational groundwork before we actually read the paper. So do you want to take us away with the abstract now? All right. Uh, in order to understand Mormon history in the 19th century context, it is necessary to understand the fertile religious soil in which it took root. 19th century American religious leaders often championed personal revelation or theophany. It's imperative to incorporate abundant first-hand accounts and circumstantial evidence of Joseph Smith's frequent use of, evident, of entheogens into existing historical models. 
These antigens provide a naturalistic explanation for angelic and prophetic visions experienced by Smith and many of his followers, where previous naturalistic historical models rely heavily on conjectural group uh, psychology and mass hallucinations often equated to Pentecostal revivalism. I think that's an important point uh, right at the end there, because oftentimes when we talk about Joseph Smith, uh, it, it, the appearance of the angels and whatnot in the, the Kirtland Temple dedication ceremony and in the School of the Prophets prior to that, a lot of that just comes down to saying, oh, well, it was Pentecostal revivalism back then. You know, people were throwing themselves around and they were doing all sorts of things uh, that that we would consider, you know, utterly insane today. And people do that today in Pentecostal revivals. Well, I think the point that we're getting at is we're talking about the same thing. It's just a matter of the dose being endogenous or exogenous, whether it's from within or it's from an external source like a plant medicine. People can get into these altered states without being dosed, but in order for a bunch of people to get into an altered state, they almost have to be dosed in a large group setting. Yeah, and again, without without the uh, dose, if if you were to go to a Pentecostal revivalist uh, revival today and maybe question people as they come out, again, I'd be shocked if twenty or thirty percent answered that they had a uh, a life changing moment of theophany. <laughs> I would be absolutely dumbfounded to hear uh, numbers even that high. But if you were to add just a little bit of a dose into the sacramental wine, that number would jump up to 70 to 90% very quickly. Wow. That's, that's pretty (laughs) impressive. And of course there, there are a lot of actual studies uh, from Johns Hopkins and from maps that are necessary to uh, link in the show notes, which we will do. Uh, to, uh, to give some scientific foundation for what we're doing. But these substances have been studied and they require further study to get a full grasp on. And it's a matter of, um, it, thrusting them into the realm of acceptance in academia instead of being a taboo subject in order for them to be accepted, uh, or in order to get funding for research and whatnot. So, I think that's important, and the way that we can normalize this a little bit more in the the general public is by showing that there may be foundations of religion in these entheogens. And I think that's kind of the point of of the paper that we're trying to drive home is like this is it's not like we're this is pie in the sky type of stuff. People were using plant medicines all over, and it, they just didn't happen to consider some of them taboo the way that we do today. We have a very postmodern, post uh, war, you know, war on drugs perspective of these entheogens, and that's not the perspective that most people have shared up to our modern day. So let me, uh, I'm going to read the introduction here and then we can get into the altered states of consciousness and entheogens in history. Introduction says, perusing firsthand accounts of Mormon history during the Kirtland and Ohio years, 1831 to 37, yields a plethora of incredible visionary accounts easily explainable with entheogens such such as ergot, datura, and psilocybe mushrooms. From Mormonism's early days on the Isaac Morley farm to the Kirtland temple dedication ceremony in 1836, There exists substantial evidence that Joseph Smith was frequently using entheogens and possibly even drugging his followers. Ignorant of modern science surrounding plant medicine and a champion of personal revelation in theophany, Smith likely perceived entheogens as a conduit to God. Understanding the plausibility of the Smith entheogen historical model requires understanding Smith's magic world of view and the knowledge surrounding him. In this paper, we begin by defining altered states of consciousness and evidence of pre-19th century entheogen use. We exhibit a brief overview of the Smith worldview, including excerpts of the science of entheogen use, providing likely candidate entheogens abundantly available to Smith. The intersection of occult rituals and plant medicine was embodied in Smith's mentor, Lumen Walters, who we'll get to, who would have taught him how to use and manipulate entheogens. We include a recently discovered inventory list from Walters Medicine Shop located in his probate records documenting medicine and much of the necessary equipment for making medicinal tinctures. Once Smith's entheogen use prior to Mormonism is established, we cover the abundant extant evidence, which can only be explained by entheogen use during the Curlin years. We conclude that the Smith entheogen historical model effectively explains Smith's ability to incite visions, revelations, and theophany in the minds of himself and early Mormons. 
The direct and indirect impact of Joseph Smith's frequent drug use merits incorporation into existing historical theories. And I think that's the entire point that we're getting at is if this is um, – if Joseph Smith was using these entheogens, that does explain a lot of things. That does offer a naturalistic explanation to a lot of things that happened in early Mormon history. Well, uh, one thing that maybe my audience might know might not know is, is that the this revelatory period of Mormon history ended with Smith, essentially. Um, yes, this, this period where somebody would come up to you and say, "Hey, tomorrow at sacrament meeting, after we all get our hymns and sacrament uh, uh, <laughs> taken care of, you're going to talk to God, or you're going to see the face of Jesus." And these people consistently and reliably would do so and then report them in their journals and such. And <laughs> that period died with Smith, essentially. Yeah, that is important to note. And <laughs> and it wasn't just in Mormonism that Smith uh, – that there's evidence of Smith using these things. It's all prior to his days of Mormonism, prior to the Book of Mormon, during the writing of the Book of Mormon, and then, you know, after Mormonism – or after Joseph Smith, Mormonism, the, the revelations kind of drop off and it, it becomes more of a business than it does an actual, uh, religion or a mystically, uh, active type of phenomenon. So let's, let's kind of dive into what we discussed prior to reading the paper. And this is the section titled Altered States of Consciousness and Entheogens in History. You want to take us away, Cody? Uh, the most reliable way to reach altered states of mind is through chemical induction. A lifelong devoted Tibetan monk said may struggle to achieve enlightenment in a meditative state, but nearly every time somebody achieves the threshold doshas, threshold dosage of a given entheogen in proper set and setting, they're thrust into an altered state of consciousness. For the purposes of this paper and this podcast, we will be discussing <laughs> the very small subset of altered consciousness, uh, drug use, and how it may have intersected, intersected with ritualism in Mormon history. Current evidence shows that human beings have been using entheogens for thousands of years People go to very great lengths to achieve what we call altered states of consciousness, meaning any state of mind that differs from the everyday baseline. Uh, incredible things happen to the human mind when a person gets into an altered state of mind. And we've kind of we've laid the groundwork out for this, so let's let's continue to power through this section. The pursuit of altered states of consciousness, which lead to moments of theophany, which we've described all of these terms now, may be one of man's chief pursuits in life, achieving the pinnacle of spiritual enlightenment enlightenment by any and every available method. The methods of achieving an altered state of consciousness may include, but are not limited to, physical exertion to the point of complete exhaustion, hatha yoga or holotropic breathing, ecstatic dance, chanting or listening to music, religious ritualism, intimacy, or, most reliably, by some plant sub plant-based substances which are known as entheogens. We've been collectively seeking that happy place, in quotes, in many ways for longer than we've had written history. While all methods of achieving altered states of consciousness are certainly valid, entheogens are significantly more effective and reliable than other methods when it comes to eliciting experiences of religious ecstasy. This is why we set out the framework to, to uh, build up to what we're discussing now. They exhibit demonstrable chemical mechanisms for their effectiveness, especially in group settings. While group hallucinations are not unheard of, without the use of entheogens, these shared experiences become exponentially more difficult to replicate with each additional participant. So I think that's kind of the main takeaway of that paragraph. When you have a huge group of people, it's really hard to get them to all see a vision of God or, you know, to have that moment where they feel connected to the divine. Whereas when you have just a small group of people, it's exponentially easier to get them into that state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we use proper set and setting to reach altered states of consciousness in a safe and comfortable way. The experiences during altered states are scarcely describable as the associated emotions evolved long before our written language and are often given simplistic and outdated definitions like spiritual, transcendent, or sacred, often attributed to God. I think you said that really well, Cody. You said, well, we just use like little words from our mouth hole in order to, to describe what we're experiencing. But, uh, it's, these are ineffable experiences. They're just completely indescribable. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, just uh, watch any frustrated parent try to uh, explain sex to their kids. It's the same type of idea. <laughs> That's, uh, that, that's that day is coming for uh, for many of us ahead. I think. <laughs> All right, you want to take us away? Sure. This is where dogma and ritualism come into play. One great way to fill the time in a given set and setting is by engaging in ritualistic behavior and entertainment of sorts. Prior to the existence of easily accessible media, and even today, it's it's up to a ceremonial guide to. Per- to program the set and setting to occupy the minds of those who imbibe and the given entheogen, subsequently entering an altered state of consciousness. The phrase altered states of consciousness describes admittedly a subjective experience as everybody's consciousness is inherently subjective. An altered state of mind can be as simple as the feeling during a favorite song or the ability to ignore the world when engaging in a favorite hobby. It can mean a runner's high or a marijuana high, Altered states of consciousness can be that bosom-burning God when reading a favorite scripture passage. Entheogens are chemical substances, typically of plant or mycological origin, that are administered to produce an altered state of consciousness for religious, spiritual, or ritualistic purposes, but can also be taken recreationally. Like you said earlier, not judging, just saying they can be. Mm -hmm. They are most often used as either a vehicle for or a supplemental aid to reaching a state of religious ecstasy, a moment of divine gnosis or theophany. As demonstrated by Harvard theology student Walter Pank's 1962 Good Friday experiment, even a single dose administered under religiously compliant set and setting proved to be one of the most meaningful and profoundly religious experiences of the participants' lives. Considering that the participants were themselves Harvard theology students, their immediate and long-term analysis of analysis of the psilocybin-induced religious ecstasy was provided from an educated and genuine perspective." And I love the quote that that we have included in here because I think that that really encapsulates everything about the or the important parts of the Good Friday experience. Mm-hmm. Long term meditators and religious practitioners regularly report the profound yet ineffable difference between endogenously or internal and exogenously external elicited religious ecstasy. Specifically, the comparison of prayer and meditation versus the effects brought on by clinically administered psilocybin. Now, this is the uh, the quote that you were talking about uh, from Timothy Leary, who uh, many of my audience might know, but uh, for your audience, he was a uh, Harvard psychology professor who was kicked out after his involvement with the uh, Harvard psilocybin project. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> and this is uh, his quote. Quote, We have arranged transcendent experiences for over 1,000 persons from all walks of life, including 69 full-time religious professionals, about half of whom profess the Christian or Jewish faith, and about half of whom belong to Eastern religions. Included in this roster are two college deans, a divinity college president, three university chaplains, an an executive of a religious foundation, a prominent religious editor, and several distinguished religious philosophers. At this point, it is conservative to state that over 75% of these subjects report intense mystical religious responses, and considerably more than half claim that they have had the deepest spiritual experience of their life. Unquote. <laughs> uh, wow. That's really profound. You know, that many people having a, an experience. These people are educated theology professors, a dean of a or, sorry, a divinity college president, uh, two college deans. I mean, very highly educated people saying, "Yeah, this was this was something crazy that I just experienced." Yeah, wow. this, this wasn't just a teenager listening to Pink Floyd. This was like these are people who have <laughs> these are people who have studied religion for their entire life. And and more than half of them that experienced this said it was the deepest spiritual experience of their life. I think that says a lot in that last sentence. Yeah. This was the first of many studies exhibiting the fact that people from all demographics and belief spectra can have incredible experiences in altered states of consciousness when entheogens are induced exogenously in a controlled set and setting. Evidence of the entheogenic administration of plants and fungi reaches far back to the very beginning of documentable history and is almost culturally universal. That's a profound claim, but we set this up. 
The examples included in this paper are a small fraction of the available evidence that supports this hypothesis. Virtually anywhere cattle veneration or tribal animism is found, and the examples provided are Africa, India, Greece, Gaul, Scandinavia, Britain, China, North Central and South America, Australia, etc. Multiple examples of religious cults using hallucinogenic materials abound. And then there's a quote here from Clark Heinrich, which kind of, uh, it, it sets up this, uh, this claim that basically everywhere people have been using these things that we call illicit drugs now, but they're, they weren't, they didn't carry that stigma back then. Do you want to read the quote for us? Sure. Quote, the idea of drug use in religion is a very controversial subject. It is also a subject about which many people are rather sensitive preferring to consider such usage as an aberration of the distant past. Yet it remains a topic that ignorance will not make disappear. <laughs> In a time when wars are being waged against drug use and illegal drugs are lumped together as the enemy, it is more important than ever to speak out openly and rationally about drugs, especially those that serve a useful and relatively benign purpose, unquote. Right. And maybe that's kind of the point that we're getting to here, because, uh, like... <sighs> These drugs, I, so many drugs are looped together, um, and stigmatized as, uh, you know, horrible things that will cause you to do horrible things. Um, you know, I remember being in middle school and seeing the, the pictures of people who took PCP and thought that they could fly, so they jumped off of a building or whatever. And, oh, God, just uh, go to YouTube and look up, uh, Reefer Madness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Exactly. And that's just marijuana. Like, yeah. I mean, so, so many of these drugs are completely stigmatized, but I think that, that, uh, that last sentence there, especially those that serve a useful and relatively benign purpose, people have never like smoked weed and then thought that they could fly, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. like the, the worst thing that could happen with these drugs is that you have a profound experience that is, uh, you know, like the trip turns bad on you and you happen to see what you, uh, perceived to be a demon standing in front of you and you lose your mind for a few minutes, but then you always come back down off of these things. And of course, the worst, worst case scenario would be overdose, but I mean, th well, people are overdosing on many worse and more terrible, more malignant drugs nowadays. Well, and comparatively, just, just to give you an idea, uh, psilocybin, for example, if you were to try an overdose on psilocybin, you would literally have to eat pounds and pounds of material you would wow. think of like a giant thanksgiving dinner and then doubling that and that's <laughs> roughly that's roughly the ld50 range where you're that's just where you're approaching uh the danger zone ld50 re uh, refers to the lethal dose 50 where 50 percent of the particip the dose at which 50 percent of the participants die and to even approach that ld50 for psilocybin is is you have to be trying and with LSD, <laughs> uh -huh. aside from any psychological repercussions, uh, as far as anyone's concerned, there really is no LD50 for, for LSD. You would have to be drinking gallons and gallons of it, which one drop is uh, a, a clinically uh, or pharmaceutical grade LSD is roughly 250 to 300 mics, um, which is a standard threshold dose. So... <laughs> one drop can get you there and you'd have to be drinking gallons and gallons to be in any danger. So that's, yeah, they, these are incredibly benign. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, you know, I lived in Colorado before I live in, you know, lived in Washington where I live now. Like I, I would meet tons of people who would say I can smoke a pound of weed a day and not even feel it because like, it's impossible to overdose on weed. Like that is, that's a benign I, that's something that doesn't really have a negative impact in any way, but it does serve a useful purpose for the, the sheer sake of getting to a religious or a mystical, uh, type of theophany or to get into an altered state of consciousness, even not under a religious, uh, set and setting. Or just recreationally, like there, we shouldn't disparage people who use these things recreationally in order to make a movie more interesting or whatever, too. Well, and on the side of most people's prescription bottle, it says, "Don't operate with heavy machinery." Don't it? It incorporates dose set and setting into <laughs> into pharmaceuticals today. 
Um, yeah. And, and, and there's a great Cat William joke, uh, something to the effect of, uh, you can pick up a bottle of aspirin and down the whole thing and it'll be your last headache, you know. Um, yeah, right. We every day have to deal with substances that can kill us and we have to, you know, approach them from a place of education and um, just reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's all about the dose. Be careful with your dose. Yeah. And, and educating yourself. Yeah. I, that's that's the important point is if if anybody is, uh, you know, tinkering with the idea, don't take drugging advice from a podcast. Do some, you know, do some looking up of this for yourself. Go to some reputable resources that we'll be providing in order to look these things up and understand a more holistic, you know, gain a more holistic perspective of these things. And, you know, maybe don't, don't allow your preconceptions to stigmatize what you think will come out of the experience. Be open-minded about things like this. Mm -hmm. And a good idea is always to have a babysitter, have somebody that you, you trust yeah. uh, that's around and knows what you're doing and can get you help if you need it. Um, yes. Uh, or it can just be there to support you. you know, yeah. Uh, or to ground you when, when you need it or whatever. Yeah. yeah. All right. Continuing on with the paper, because that's a huge digression, but still a relevant digression. Our current understanding of the role mind-altering plants and mushrooms have played in the development of human culture is dismally lacking and underappreciated. It has only been in the last two decades that these substances have been experiencing a renaissance in, in serious reevaluation from the scientific community. Boston University classicist Carl A.P. Ruck, who first helped popularize the word entheogen, postulates that the other methods of achieving religious ecstasy mentioned above are a result of the entheogenic substances proving seasonally or annually unavailable. Drought, pathogens, insect, and animal predation all play a major factor in the regular availability of these plants of fungi. Ruck along with several other prominent scholars in his field, further hypothesized that agriculture was originally introduced as a way to secure a consistent source of these entheogenic plant materials. And I think it's, I think it's important to uh, reiterate there that, that he's saying that the, the endogenous methods like yoga and breathing and dance and everything are, were, were used when the actual entheogenic substances were not available. So it was the fallback, the, the, the prayer, the meditation, all of that was secondary to the substance itself. Interesting. Okay. And a uh, quick side note as well. I've had Carl Ruck on my podcast that was uh, back uh, a few months ago I when I went to Boston and interviewed him uh, on the cross-country tour. And I know you just aired your conversation with him that you had a few months ago as well on episode eight of your show. And that was a really, really good interview. So there, uh, I definitely Thank recommend you. if people are wanting to dive further into this, listen to both of those episodes and you'll, you'll get a proper introduction to who Carl Ruck is and uh, his expertise in entheogen use and the Eleusinian mysteries, which we'll get into here. Um, and then there's – there's uh, we include the quote that you included from uh, – I, I can't pronounce that name. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, and it says, you know, far from being consumed for hedonistic purposes, uh, so on and so forth. You already read that quote, so I think we can skip it. Uh, do you want to take us on to the next paragraph? Yeah. Uh, in his book, The Food of the Gods, Terence McKenna postulates that the transformation of human early ancestor Homo erectus to the species Homo, Homo sapiens uh, was attributed to the addition of hallucinogenic mushrooms. Um, an event that, according to his theory, took place around 100,000 BCE. Also put forward by McKenna is that our ancestors' subsequent development and sophistication of language, art, music, tools, and agriculture were owed to regular, socially accepted intoxication of hallucinogenic mushrooms. Wow. Uh, and life was certainly not easy for our early ancestors. Seasonal diet restrictions inevitably led to food experimentation, which in turn leads to the discovery of new medicinal or poisonous plants into a community's herb lore. The fine line between poisoning and medicine is often quickly realized by the more observant or experimental members of the community. Those who don't understand the onset of poisonous chemicals uh, often don't stick around very long to further experiment. <laughs> yeah, good point. And 
We came out of the Fertile Crescent, uh, what, about that time, about a hundred thousand years ago. As mm-hmm. we were going to these new places, as uh, Homo sapien was uh, conquering new territories and taking it over from whatever uh, plants and animals were living there and hunting and feeding on the animals and eating the roots and herbs that they found. I mean, obviously they were experimenting and that's how we have our current uh, modern diet is the evolution of all of the experimentation and how we know that, yeah, you don't eat poison ivy because those who do eat poison ivy aren't around any longer to eat more of it. Uh So, yeah, I think that holds a lot of explanatory power for the, the evolution and further experimentation of the, the human genome. Now, uh, moving on. McKenna has been highly criticized for his lack of paleontological citation, as we mentioned. Uh, We can probably skip through this little bit. There is a rising body of evidence emerging from analyzing the residue left in ancient storage containers that a score of hallucinogenic plants and fungi were regularly being used by the ecclesiastical and high-status elite, if not more commonly by the lower social status classes as well. Very interesting. Okay, let's let's talk on that a little bit because that's when we start to get into where there actually is archaeological uh, evidence for what we're discussing here, and that's primarily coming out of where we see this cradle of civilization um, in you know near Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia with the Sumerians, as well as the evolution of the Egyptian culture. And the ritualistic nature and the very habitual nature that they had of their religious rites and their burial rites and everything. That's, that's kind of where we, the societies that we uphold as the pinnacle of, um, modern humanity and modern civilization. Well, it's, it's important to note as well that the first documented written records that we do have, uh, are either referring to myths or God. Uh, yeah. land deeds or uh, business transactions or frankly beer recipes uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah some very i mean we have some you know four and five thousand year old beer recipes as well as people that are saying hey don't drink too much you know woe unto those who drink too much for when they wake up they're going to be screwed over basically well, and, right? and like the, the sumerians and the mesopotamians and the egyptians who you're we talking about we know for a fact they were using things like datura and mandrake uh as admixtures into their beer recipes um and, and so just a very small amount of beer would get you uh hallucin- hallucinogenically stoned not just uh alcoholically drunk and and it get you very close to uh, or it would put you in that altered state of consciousness uh getting you very close or suggestible to the point that you with the proper set and setting you can attain that ultimate theophany that we've been describing this whole time mm-hmm. well and often these 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 beers were administered in temples and in uh in church settings, as we'll see in a moment. Sacrament, baby. <laughs> that's where, mm-hmm. I go. mean, that's, that's what our primary claim here is that this was the evolution of sacrament. This is where sacrament really came from. Mm-hmm. One religious leader who was administering entheogens through wine or through oil or through, you know, anointing oil through, uh, you know, uh, topical, uh, anointing or whatever the case is. And the people having an experience and the religious leader guiding that experience, guiding the set and setting so that they can have that connection so that they can feel like they're connected to whatever deity that they worship. So this is the foundation of religion, basically. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, that that's a strong claim and that's probably overgeneralizing, but that's essentially what we're claiming here. <laughs> well, and it's not just us claiming it either. This is uh, backed up by... A lot of scholars that are, it's just, it's too much to go into. It's a, it's too long a digression. Um, I, I, probably one book that everybody could pick up easily at a library or on Amazon would be Plants of the Gods. Um, that was, uh, partly co-authored by Albert Hoffman, uh, who first synthesized LSD 25 and psilocybin. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, that's a good point is that this is this is not a new theory this is not a new claim this is nothing new this is just forward forwarding and um wrapping this this naturalistic explanation for religious ecstasy into mormonism and we're setting out the foundations for that but now i think we're we're kind of getting into 
grounds where we have really good, solid evidence of religious leaders creating a set and setting and administering a psychoactive dosage. And that is the Eleusinian mysteries. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's get into it because this is a huge thing. I, I feel like we could spend the entire time talking about this. <laughs> of course, episode eight of your show, you talked about this quite a lot. So we, we don't want to belabor the point here, but let's get through it and kind of describe what happened at the Eleusinian mysteries. All right. The philosophical and religious mecca of the ancient Greek world was undoubtedly the Eleusinian Mysteries. The Mysteries were an annually held series of initiation ceremonies for the cult of Demeter and Persephone based at the plains of Eleusis. Starting in approximately 1500 BCE, the Eleusinian Mysteries reliably administered on an annual basis an experience of visionary gnosis to the masses, which lasted for uh, nearly two, two millennia. Wow. This, wow. This yeah, uh, uninterrupted, mind you. So, That's amazing. And aside from one incident, uh, it was largely kept secret. Um, <laughs> uh, this ceremony. Listen, a, uh, just listen to Silly Rabbit's episode eight to to hear about that incident. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't we won't mention it here. Um, this this ceremony, the Ellison in Mysteries. Uh, was available to all classes of society, and nearly every major mover and shaker of ancient Greece attended. Um, basically, every philosopher you've ever heard of attended the, these mysteries. Um, initiates could attend the ceremony only once in a lifetime and were sworn to secrecy thereafter. Uh, now, despite this secrecy, there are extant plays and writings which hint at what exactly took place at Eleusis, and uh, Proclus described the events in the following. They cause the sympathy of the souls with a ritual in a way that is incomprehensible to us and divine, so that some of the initiates are stricken with panic, being <laughs> filled with divine awe. Others assimilate themselves to the holy symbols, leave their own identity, become at home with the gods, and experience divine possession. Wow. Unquote. That is, uh, that sounds similar to the School of the Prophets. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. And one, I like that he opens that with, uh, it, it causes a sympathy of the soul that it, in a way is incomprehensible to us. It goes back to that yeah. ineffable quality of this. You just can't put it into words. Yeah. And that's something that, uh, listeners of Silly Rabbits are probably like, oh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's like every Friday night for me. But <laughs> a lot of, uh, I assume that quite a few listeners of Naked Mormonism, uh, don't, they can't empathize with what this is. They can't quite understand what what it is that we're trying to describe because it's it truly is incomprehensible it's not it, there's no way for it to be described whatever is experienced in this these altered states of consciousness i, I think the difference is more like uh, this is not a still small voice this is like a full-blown lehi's dream of the tri vision of life or the tree of life <laughs> um this is this is a full-blown experiential um uh, subjective experience that Although it changes from person to person, the archetypal roles and experiences one comes back with is almost universal. Very well said. The fact that participants of the mysteries would drink from a sacred vessel before such ecstatic and visionary experiences cannot be ignored. It is now a well-established theory that this drink, the Kaikion, contains some kind of a hallucinogenic elixir meant to elicit an experience of theophany. The main contenders are an ergotized beer, or less plausibly, a mushroom extract of some kind, most likely from a psilocybe variety. Albert Hoffman, the first man credited with the synthesis of LSD-25, believed that the ancient Greeks had discovered a method of drawing off the convulsive al alkaloids of the ergot by skimming boiling hot oil across the surface of the hallucinogenic beer for a short time. Okay, what is what does that mean, Cody? Um, well, he, it's pretty basic chem kitchen chemistry. Um, what we know the, the recipe of the Kaikion from the, uh, Homeric hymns to Demeter. And we know that barley was used. Um, and without going too deep into a, a, a giant rabbit hole, <laughs> a, ergot is a fungal growth, uh, that you can find on uh, cultivated grains like barley and most wheats. And, the Greeks would have looked at ergot on barley as like a mature, intoxicating form of the barley itself. They wouldn't really have distinguished it as a as a mushroom. We incorporate a, a, a picture here of uh, 
uh, in our paper of Demeter holding uh, barley stalks next to opium pods, which uh, <laughs> kind of which kind of highlight this idea that a plant could also have a uh, an intoxicating secretion, if you will, which was what they were using with ergot uh, in in people like Carl Ruck's opinion. And the the ergot itself is an actual fungus that grows on the barley or on grain, and you can see it in a, a well uh, matured crop of wheat. You can see the black grain heads on top. Uh, it, it's a very clear to see the infected grain heads, and when you just um, I know this this is a a little bit of a digression here, but the when you do take the the barley and you thresh it to take out the or sorry the grain when you take grain seeds and you thresh them on the floor in order to get the the actual husks out and whisk those away in the wind you are left with the grains and when those grains are infected with ergot and you make beer out of that that causes ergotized beer or what is referred to as saint saint anthony's fire post enlightenment right mm-hmm. Well, and you can even uh, you can even isolate ergotized patches in a, a barley field that you're about to, to harvest, and you can set them aside to ensure that you have uh, you know an ergotized selection and a non-ergotized selection that would be safe for things like bread. Interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and quarantine the certain uh, the patches that you do see that are infected because mm-hmm. ergot, like uh, well, ergot, like we had just mentioned, has convulsive alkaloids, and uh, you can overdose on it. So if you're eating it on a regular basis and you don't have safe barley to eat, uh, it can get pretty nasty pretty quick. And then we have people accusing other people of witchcraft and uh, going into seizures and foaming at the mouth and doing all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff and, you know, flopping around and, uh, you know, rolling around in the snow without any clothes on. And a weird, weird stuff happens when people are hopped up on St. Anthony's fire. Mm-hmm. Um so, uh, continuing on, the examples of entheogens used by spiritual and religious leaders to elicit altered states of consciousness are surprisingly abundant. Administration of entheogens may help to explain the genesis of sacramental rituals throughout religious history. The set and setting programmed by religious leaders, like Joseph Smith, have historically created safe spaces where parishioners could freely imbibe under direction from the spiritual leader. A person's altered consciousness can allow them to explore the darkest folds of their own existence or cause them to commune with deity and experience true theophany, interpreting their own mutterings as divine revelation from on high. Joseph Smith was a spiritual leader of sorts, leading religious rituals usually involving sacrament, thus inciting personal revelation or theophany for his followers. As the Mormon's spiritual leader, Smith was responsible for programming a proper set and setting, administering entheogens through anointing oil or sacramental wine, and guiding his parishioners through their entheogenic experience, hopefully resulting in theophany, a perceived connection to deity. Entheogens played a significant cultural role throughout human history, and it's necessary to ignore modern prejudices and incorporate that information into historical models. Now, okay, we're going kind of long on this part one, but I think it's necessary to establish the Smith worldview, the magical worldview that he had, as well as some some dreams and some mentors that he had in order to set up who Joseph Smith would have been ex- exposed to in his early days, who he would have learned these things from, and then kind of take that and wrap it up into a discussion about w- – the the modern day iterations that we see of people getting together and administering sacrament and and having these spiritual type of experiences because just we've only really hit on um the on the Eleusinian mysteries and um well that's basically it here but there this this same phenomenon of people getting together and imbibing in some kind of dosage whether that dosage is exogenous or endogenous and having a set and setting program by a spiritual leader this makes its way through an evolution of various iterations and that I mean Eleusis is one of the earliest provable examples we have of this but there's also like 
there's also Moses and the evolution from Moses into Christianity and then the Kabbalah evolving out of uh, the Hebrew world following Moses. And then we have, you know, once the enlightenment comes, we have alchemy making its way, spiritual and practical alchemy, the two different sides that, that play into the, the broader world of alchemy playing together. And then we have, uh, the evolution of, um, tons of these iterations of groups of people getting together and chasing these altered states of consciousness. And for the sake of time, it's really hard to describe or to name these various groups of people getting together, but we're pointing out this, this same phenomenon that exists in human existence here. Well, in, in each point, each one of those points you just mentioned could be their own uh, two hour podcast. Um, <laughs> but the, the point of the point, I think you're, you were illustrating is that there's there's a direct chain of evidence from Mesopotamia and Sumeria from the very first written records, like we mentioned, all the way through Egypt to Eleusis to Moses to Christianity um, through the Dark Ages. It, it survived separately among, in China and among Islamic scholars. Then it went into alchemy, and it, yeah, it's there is a direct chain of evidence from the earliest written record that this is the origin of sacrament. Well said. So let's let's jump into the Smith worldview here uh, and kind of blast through a little bit of this. Historians are engaged in a never-ending struggle to understand the founder of Mormon history, Joseph Smith Jr., and the world in which he flourished. The product of a magic worldview and exceptionally intelligent, Smith likely consumed any publications which were incestuously passed around his occult treasure-digging groups. Smith likely would have filled the role of a charismatic apprentice to a number of occult practitioners such as Samuel Lawrence, Joseph Knight Sr., Lumen Walters, and especially Smith's own father, Joseph Smith senior. Lucy Mack and Joseph Sr., Smith's parents, had incredible formative power in shaping the young prophet's perception of reality and teaching him necessary life skills. While Lucy Mack was a faithful Christian, uh, Joseph Sr. was a passionate practitioner of Anakian magic in the form of divining and money digging. It was Joseph Sr. who initiated Joseph Smith Jr. into these arcane practices. Joseph Sr. quickly recognized the inherent charismatic skills of his son, allowing him to take charge as seer for their treasure-digging expeditions at a relatively young age. All right, pause here. This is going to be a little bit of a digression, but it's relevant. I remember when I was young reading through the – I think it's the Book of Moses. It's somewhere in the Pearl of Great Price, and it's talking about Enoch and Enoch seeing visions and communing with God and seeing all time and eternity played out in front of his eyes and whatnot. And I'm like, who is this Enoch guy? And Joseph focused on Enoch so much. And I always wondered where Enoch was derived from – well, until like seven months ago. <laughs> but – can you kind of describe to us the this idea of Enochian magic and the the prominent people who tried to uh, like like John D who tried to make the Enochian uh, alphabet and how important Enoch Enoch is to this magic worldview? So um, Enoch was the prophet that apparently was after living like over 350 years or something was so uh, perfect and righteous that God just kind of took him and his people into heaven directly. None of them had to die. So he was apparently one of the uh, first practitioners of magic uh, or Kabbalah was very adept at summoning angels and communing with deity. Um, most of Enochian magic is concerned with just that. Um, it's, it was popularized by John D. Um, well, uh, I guess Agrippa was. Uh, anyway, that's a long digression. John D. popularized uh, Enochian magic uh, with his partner, uh, Edward Kelly, in a, a number of seances that are eerily reminiscent of uh, the translation process to the Book of Mormon. Yeah, J Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon are John D. and Edward Kelly in this <laughs> duo of revelation here. These seances where one of them is asking, what do you see? I see this. Oh, I see this as well. Kind of similar circumstances happen with John D. and Edward Kelly. Mm -hmm. I'm almost down to the to the wire. Like it, there was wife swapping. They were reading out of uh, magic stones and yeah, <laughs> all of that. Yep. Um, but Enochian magic is concerned with uh, angelic um, 
summoning, as I, I mentioned, and uh, Edward Kelly and John Dee had a, a number of um, sessions with these Anakian angels, and they wrote uh, manuals, if you will, on how to summon them. And it's pretty apparent that uh, Joseph Sr. and his uh, money-digging group were using uh, iterations of this Anakian magic. Okay, okay, that's uh, that's enough of a definition, a uh, functional definition to just get us by. But like you said, every topic that we're 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 invoking into this conversation deserves its own couple hours worth of discussion because the the folds and the rabbit holes are so so deep. No matter how many layers of this onion you peel back, it's just it just keeps giving more and more. It's it's absolutely incredible. I mean, Cody, you've been researching this for, I think you told me like six years or something now. I've been yeah. engaged in this for, uh, for seven months and I, my mind is consistently blown every time I talk to you about this stuff. So <laughs> it's a long rabbit hole to jump down. Everybody jump down it with us. All right. It is from the same books of ceremonial magic, which numerous researchers have linked to the creation of Smith Sr.'s collection of magical items. We find explicit recipes and experimental descriptions of hallucinogenic plant mixtures. Ebenezer Sibley described various plant medicines to be effective in ways which are perceptible and visible to the senses, while other odiferous herbs act by occult power, which the eye cannot see and the mind cannot comprehend. All right. Ebenezer Sibley, this is an important guy when it comes to the Smith worldview because we have some manuscripts from Sibley's books that were found in the Smith family collection uh, after Joseph Smith's death, right? Uh, well, people like Michael Quinn and Dan Vogel, who are Mormon historians, um, think that the uh, Ebenezer Sibley's uh, Book of Occult uh, Sciences was used as source material for the for the uh, magical collection. All right. Uh, so this is the quote from Ebenezer Sibley that we include here, uh, describing these odiferous herbs and these things are that are not perceptible, visible to the senses. Quote: It was the opinion of many eminent physicians that such kind kind of charms or parapets are consistent. Uh, as consisted of certain odiferous herbs, balsamic roots, and most probably possessed by means of their strong medicinal properties, the virtue of curing or removing such complaints as external applications might affect, and which are often used with success, though without the least surprise or admiration, because the one appears in a great measure to be the consequence of a manual operation, which is perceptible and visible to the senses. A manual operation, I assume, being sacrament or something to that effect. Whilst the other acts by an innate or occult power, which the eye cannot see nor the mind so readily comprehend. Uh, end quote by Ebenezer Sibley. Okay. Um, Barton Stafford, a neighbor of the Smith family in Palmyra, reported, quote, Joseph Smith Sr. was a drunkard and most of the family followed his example. <laughs> it should be great role model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It should be noted that the mindset of the pre-prohibition pre American concerned itself with drunkenness more so than the vehicle or method for achieving said drunkenness. Because the pharmaceutical industry had yet to be established, med uh, medicinal or psychoactive plants were used exclusively by Americans in the early 19th century as folk medicine. In addition, beers, ciders, and wines were often used as a staple source of safe hydration, and a great many people of the day drank diluted alcohol out of sheer necessity. Yeah, well, and the the Smiths were also molasses farmers. They would um, every fall they would harvest molasses from the the pine that they have around there, or the the cedar, or wherever wherever molasses is distilled or is taken from. And molasses uh, is one great catalyst for making uh, whiskey or for making alcohol. And it also works really good to sweeten up a cider that has bitterance in it as well. So uh, – and sheer necessity too because, well, water back then wasn't exactly a clean thing. Everybody had to boil their water to make it safe. But that wasn't always a reasonable thing to have on hand, whereas something with alcohol in it usually killed a lot of the things that were bad for people in it. So, yeah, well, it even, was out of sheer necessity. Well, and even good good water. Um, I live out in the country. A lot of people know when you have a well, sometimes it gets sulfury. And uh, using mm -hmm. an, a little bit of wine in your water also makes it a little more palatable. Interesting. 
And uh, yeah, <laughs> they didn't exactly have Fiji back then. All right. <laughs> right. A wine or cider infused with offensive tasting plant medicines, which um, what we're describing here often are, were often sweetened with honey or molasses to render the tincture palpable. It's likely the case that when we often see reference to sweetened alcohol in the historical record, the sweetening was done to cover the taste of whatever bitter herb caused the drink to require sweetening. Additionally, the sweetening agent itself could be used to store psychoactive chemicals long term, which could subsequently be put into any drink or drink to render it psychoactive. The evidence for intemperance in the Smith family far outweighs any naive preconception of the prophet's sobriety. So we know that uh, – okay, I think we're, we're going to get into this in a minute here. But like they also had to extract certain plant medicines and preserve them through crystallization or through uh, honey extraction or through whatever means in order to store these things for long periods of time because – it's not like they always had access to these these plants and roots that were medicinal. They had to preserve them somehow, so they could use them year round. Yep, and there's a there's a whole plethora of methods for doing that and uh, administering them with those preservative agents. Like you said, uh, honey, for example, uh, you can just add psychoactive mushrooms to a honey medium. And then basically, um, after a few months, it imparts its hallucinogenic properties into the honey. And you can, I've seen dosing charts where you dip your finger and for each, uh, uh, section of your pinky finger, that's a, um, you know, light dose, medium dose, heavy dose. Wow. <laughs> and, and what the, it reacts, uh, topically through your skin or you just like eat that amount of it or what? Yeah. You eat that, you eat that amount of honey or like, uh, stir it into your tea or whatever you would, you would do. Wow. Fascinating. Uh, they call it blue honey. Blue honey. Interesting. I thought I, I, I might have seen a vice documentary on that. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, extracting and preserving active chemicals in plants was a necessary skill for any farmer like the Smiths trying to make their way in the competitive field of root sales. Competent in these skills, Joseph Sr. crystallized several thousand dollars worth of ginseng in the early 1800s and subsequently lost the family fortune. This is the story that many Mormons know that caused the Smiths to be completely destitute for all of their days. Um, but obviously, Smith uh, Sr. was quite familiar with – uh, at least rudimentary extractions of plant medicines and uh, storage uh, capabilities in order to crystallize ginseng and send it off to China to be sold off for a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Sr. was one of many people with whom Joseph Jr. frequently associated as a personal mentor. And any skills Sr. possessed would have been eagerly learned by the bright young Smith or simply picked up through osmosis. Joseph Smith had many mentors in the treasure digging group, and while it's commonly understood that Joseph Sr. and the treasure diggers, uh, including Walters, Lawrence, the Chases, uh, Stowell, Knights, etc., uh, were all business partners. They were also likely very good friends who shared fascinations and fields of study, likely spending many non-working hours in each other's company. Given the, this group's occult colleagues uh, steeped in magic, Joseph Sr. wasn't the only person influencing Joseph Jr.'s education as a bright young man. Would have been little more than uh, as a bright young man would have been little more than learning alchemy and plant manipulation root doctoring from a number of his friends and mentors in the treasure digging group. This folk education was only rarely punctuated by occasional bouts of structured schooling. The most likely candidate for expanding Smith's mind in these magical subjects and substances is Lumen Walters, who we mentioned earlier. All right. And we're going to get uh, deep into Lumen Walters, but let's conclude this section. Entheogen use in ritualism and the occult world into which Joseph Smith Jr. matured leads to the conclusion that he had knowledge of and frequently used entheogens, likely extracted and preserved in alcoholic beverages. To claim Smith was using these plant medicines recreationally misses the point. They were crucial to his understanding of the magical world surrounding him. The spirit of God literally lived inside the plants to Smith. It was through the use of entheogens that Smith could hallucinate buried treasure when staring at the small brown rock in his hat. It was through entheogens that Smith could dictate the Book of Mormon almost endlessly from an indescribable source. And, as the early history of the Mormon Church progressed, through the use of entheogens, Smith received hundreds of revelations on the nature and teachings of Mormon gospel. 
And then, so that was a brief dive into Joseph Smith uh, later on, post-Mormonism, but this, we we still have to establish who these mentors were and who the likely candidates were that taught Joseph how to, how to use these things, how to properly administer and manipulate these various plant medicines. And Lumen Walters presents our most likely candidate for a couple of reasons that we'll get into soon. Okay. Um... While still a young teen in the early 1820s, Joseph Smith met a legitimate hermetic and magical influence in fellow treasure digger and seer Lumen Walters. Joseph is reported by several sources to have picked up his ceremonial uh, magical repertoire after meeting and working with Walters, who showed an interest in the clearly intelligent, albeit uneducated pupil. Michael Quinn, uh, a Mormon historian, theorizes that the young Joseph Smith looked to Walters as an occult mentor. This is from uh, Lance Owen's article on alchemy and the rise of Mormonism. Quote, he was a distant cousin of Joseph's future wife, Emma Hale. As Quinn notes, Brigham Young described the unnamed New York magician as having traveled extensively through Europe to obtain profound learning. Mm -hmm. And others identified Walters as a physician who studied mesmerism in Europe before meeting Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. Walters' family records and legend called him a clairvoyant. And if these statements are generally accurate, Walters possessed considerable knowledge of hermetic traditions. During this period in Europe, and to a lesser degree in America, a physician with interests in mesmer magic, clairvoyance, and profound learning moved in a milieu nurtured by the legacies of hermeticism. By, de- by definition, such a physical... S- by definition, such a physician stood in a tradition dominated by the medical and esoteric writings of Paracelsus, steeped in alchemy and associated closely with Rosicrucian philosophy, unquote. There were a lot of words in there that we have not discussed yet, but I would recommend that people jump onto Lance Owen's Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah because it's this massive essay that basically sets out um, – it builds on D. Michael Quinn's assertions of Joseph Smith's early magical influences and really wraps them into the magical worldview of Rosicrucianism and Hermeticism and the Kabbalah and you know the earliest uh, Kabbalah teaching that were that really venerated this this magical and uh, these these mystical experiences in in connection with trance like states that Joseph Smith was quite familiar with. So there's so much, so so much in that one quote <laughs> to try <laughs> and unpack. But we, for the sake of time, we just we can't get any further into it. Essentially, Walters was a magician and had picked up a kind of medical misto mystico uh repertoire in europe yeah, he was steeped in both uh medicinal plant teachers and this kind of money digging treasure seeking uh uh Inachian magic stuff yeah and and he was in the perfect place for these things to happen or, or to learn this type of magic i i mean in europe where he traveled through france and germany and the united well what would be the united kingdom these these places were a hotbed for this kind of magical philosophy that was going on and it's important to note that you know if somebody was going to gain a knowledge for the use of entheogens europe was the place to do it and it's not like europe and america America were disconnected in the uh, late seven or late eighteenth and early nineteenth century. Things and publications which were published in Europe were they would take usually like three to four months to get over to America, and then whatever was going on over there was happening in some kind of reflected version on this side of the Atlantic. Like this was a very incestuous type of community and people that were reading up on mesmerism and hermeticism, they would know who John D and Paracelsus and, and uh, Agrippa were, they would know who all of these, you know, these, these niche celebrities that they followed were. Yeah. It's a bit like a a modern uh, physicist we've mentioned, uh, not knowing who Albert Einstein or, Stephen Hawking is. Yeah, yeah, they were the celebrities of that niche of of school of philosophy. That that's what it was. And the paper goes on further to describe this. To add context, Paracelsus was a 16th century physician who made incredible advances in medical science, early chemistry, alchemy, and astronomy. He was renowned for his writings on spagyrics and tinctures. And spagyrics and tinctures are 
you know, potions, medicinal potions, and is often falsely credited as being the inventor of pills as we know them today. Paracelsus did invent laudanum, an opium tincture, which would become the preferred anesthetic and pain reliever for the next several centuries. Lumen Walters, aside from practicing as a ceremonial magician, also became known later in life for his use of tinctures and herbal remedies. Given that the source books used to create the Smith family lumen, or parchments of ceremonial magic, contain explicit sections devoted to the work of Paracelsus, it stands to reason that Walters was also in a possession to furnish the Smiths with the ethnobotanical information necessary to incorporate psychoactive plant medicines into their magical practices. And in addition to his connection with the Smith family money-digging group, Pomeroy Tucker cites the Walters as one of the early members of the Mormon Church when it was still the Church of Christ. In 1834, shortly after his wife passed away while delivering their last child, Walters purchased property in Gorham, New York, where he remained a resident on census records until his death in 1860. It is currently unclear if Lumen actually made the exodus to Kirtland with the rest of the saints, and although Lumen himself appears to have severed ties with the early church after 1834, it seems at least some of his immediate family did stay with the saints. Ancestry.com lists his twin brother Eber as a member in Kirtland, Ohio, and Lumen's second cousin Dorothy Walters is mentioned in the first Relief Society ro rosters in Nauvoo. Practicing magic and esoteric arts may have run in the family as Dorothy's husband Benjamin Hoyt was asked by his bishop in 1843 to, quote, cease to call certain characters witches or wizards, cease to work with the divining rod, and cease burning boards to heal those he said were bewitched. Unquote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It was a family tradition, the Walters family tradition. And this was well, somebody that's... who was a mentor to Joseph Smith. Yeah, well, and clearly the, the magical tradition survived into the early days of the actual church itself, not just in, you know, Joseph's early uh, teens. Yeah, yeah, obviously. I mean, and he took all of these teachings with him into Mormonism. And there are still things, it, you know, I've covered this in the last couple episodes of my show. It, it, there are certain teachings that Joseph Smith had that he brought over from his magical worldview into Mormonism, including like, uh, the, the unnamed angel appearing to him three times completely clothed in white and his spiritual litmus test of like shaking hands with a spirit to see if it's a spirit of God or a spirit of the devil or if it's a resurrected being in corporeal form. Like these are things that Joseph Smith was taught in his early magic world and he just synthesized them together to create Mormonism, his own school of philosophy basically. Mm -hmm. Although Lumen Walters' time with the Saints was relatively brief, Walters certainly made a lasting impression on at least one prominent church member. Brigham Young made the following statement in an 1857 address, which seems to describe the relationship between Walters and a young Joseph Smith. Now quoting Brigham Young, quote, Joseph was what we call an ignorant boy, but this fortune teller, whose name I do not remember, was a man of profound learning. He had put himself in possession of all the learning in the States, had been to France, Germany, Italy, and through the world, had been educated for a priest, and turned out to be a devil. I do not know, but that he would have been a devil if he had followed the profession of a priest among what are termed the Christian denominations. He could preach as well as the best of them. He could preach as well as the best of them, and I never heard a man swear as he did. He could tell that those plates were there, and that they were a treasure whose value to the people could not be told, for that I myself heard him say, end, uh, end quote from Brigham Young. So that's the second of the prophet saying, Lumen Walters was a profound, uh, profoundly learned man, it was educated as a priest among Christian denominations, he knew where the plates were, he knew the, the value of the treasure of the plates, like, obviously, Lumen Walters had a dramatic impact on the young Joseph Smith. Moving on. Uh, we have recently discovered documentary information surrounding Lumen Walters and his professional life after his brief time with the Saints. The Ontario County Records Department has in a micro, on microfilm a massive probate file on Walters. His estate was handled by Joseph Hershey and Daniel Walters, the latter being Lumen's son, where they kept scrupulous notes including inventory lists of his possessions after death. This, uh, from his 
obituary and probate records, we know Walters was an eccentric root and yarb doctor, uh, owning his own Emporium Medical Tincture Shop in Gorham, New York. So before you read that, I just have to say this is one thing that I did while I was out on the Mormon History Tour. This is one one reason why I wanted to go to Gorham, New York and drive around that town there because I wanted to look through their old historical documents and see if there was anything on Lumen Walters that has not been unearthed yet. And this is something that hasn't been included in any – in any history book, just because it's mundane information to most people. But when you interpret it, uh, through the eyes of, uh, Lumen Walters being Joseph Smith's, um, uh, uh, mentor, magic mentor, his, his, the, the articles that exist, his, um, obituaries in conjunction with these record lists that we have of his inventory really bring together the fact that he was somebody who uh he was quite well adept in the usage and manipulation of roots and herbs and was known as an eccentric doctor so first we're going to read a couple of excerpts from uh various um uh, articles and obituaries that were written about him, and then we'll read a chunk from his actual inventory list that I pulled from his microfilm records when I was actually in the Ontario County Records Department. All right. Quote, We have often heard it remarked that the fools are not all dead yet. We are convinced of the fact by a letter which has been placed in our hands, of which the following is a verbatim copy. Dr. Walters, to whom it is addressed, has some reputation as a physician skilled in the curative properties of root, roots and yarbs and brandy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that he brings to his aid a conjuration stone, a seer as, stone. Believed, uh -huh, as believed in by his Vermont doctor or by this Vermont doctor surpasses the credulity of Dr. Walters neighbors. So Dr. he was a seer. <laughs> uh huh. Dr. L. Walter, Dr. L. Walters, for many years known as a successful but eccentric practitioner of the medical profession, died at his residence at Bethel, Ontario County on Sunday last. He styled himself a seer or clairvoyant doctor and has effected many very wonderful cures, unquote. Very interesting. Continuing on. From these select passages, among many others, we understand that Walters was well-respected as a root and herb doctor, albeit eccentric by the standards of some of the locals, and was also quite adept in clairvoyance and the use of seer stones. Thanks to the scrupulous inventory recounted by the men who handled Walter's estate after his death, we see many things Walter used to make his famous medicinal tinctures. And this is taken directly from those inventory lists. I have uh, PDF copies of all of these in a file sitting on my bookshelf here. Among many other possessions, Walter's inventory list includes line items of, quote, one cider barrel, one pounding barrel, 50th of Columbo root, a lot of liquid medicine, spelled with an S, 10 bottles of it, a lot of dry medicine, 15 yards of carpet, and you and I kind of hypothesize that might have been used for spore cultivation, you know, uh, mushroom spores. There's a sack of hops and about 40 loads of manure, Valued at $25.50 back then. That was a lot of manure that he was using to grow stuff. Especially when you uh, couple it with the 15 yards of carpet, which you can flip upside down and use to create mycelial colonies. There you go. And then uh, five to seven total medical books. And there are, uh, I mean, the inventory list goes for, it's like 15 pages, but those are just a few of the extracts that I pulled from a couple different pages. But all of those are included because this guy owned an emporium. I mean, he owned a tincture shop where he sold medical tinctures. And all of these things were included in this inventory list. So we continue on in the paper. It's not enough to claim that the knowledge and manipulation of entheogens was prevalent during Joseph Smith's time and is therefore necessary to exhibit likely candidates who taught the necessary knowledge and expertise during formative years in Smith's personal history. While Joseph Sr. was the most reliable candidate, being Joseph's father, it bolsters this historical model to exhibit people like Lumen Walters who undoubtedly had relevant expertise and was described as a mentor to Smith who subsequently inherited Walters. Walter's Mantle of Treasure Digging. The Book of Pukii, the first ever <laughs> satire of uh, Joseph Smith. I just Smith. love that so much. <laughs> oh, God, I wish we could just go into the Book of Pukii on its own. <laughs> uh, um, 
Anyway, the Book of Pukii, the first ever satire of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon published in June 1830, offers some insight on how Walter's role was perceived in the treasure digging group referred to as the idle and slothful. Mm -hmm. This is quoting from uh, Abner Cole's article, who was using the pseudonym Obadiah Dogberry. Um, I want to meet this guy. He's on my short list of historical characters to me. He really is. (laughs) Well, he was Uh, was, uh, quite a writer, too. Uh, (laughs) This is from him, quote, Now Walters, the magician, was a man unseemly to look upon, (laughs) and to profound ignorance added the most consummate impudence. (laughs) He he obeyed the summons of the idle and slothful and produced an old book in an unknown tongue, which was really just Cicero's oration. Hang on, hang on, hang on. It produced an old book in an unknown tongue, and it says that it's Cicero's orations in Latin, but that really could be any old book that he brought over from Europe. I mean, that exactly. could have been something from John Dee's library. We just don't know. Yeah, it's a, uh, that'd be a bit of a stretch, but he's certainly within the realms of uh, plausibility. Um uh, anyway, continuing on, uh, from whence he read in the pres- in the presence of the idle and slothful strange stories of hidden treasures and of the spirit who had the custody thereof. Mm-hmm. Now the rest of the acts of the magician, how his mantle fell upon the prophet Joe Smith Jr., and how Joe made a league with the spirit who afterwards <laughs> torn- turned out to be an angel. And how he had obtained the gold Bible, spectacles, and breastplate. Will they not be faithfully recorded in the book of Pukii? <laughs> Unquote. <laughs> I just, you have to read uh, it in that voice, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> and th- that's just two verses. He published, I think there are two chapters of the book of Pukii that he, re- he recounted. And it tells the whole story of Lumen Walters running with the Smiths and uh, Lumen being chased out of town because he screwed him over on a business deal. And like, there's so... There's so much to unpack. We just took two little tiny verses from the book of Pukii, but it's really worth reading if anybody uh, fancies a good laugh of a satirical writing of the Book of Mormon. Uh, finishing this out, um, according to the author Abner Cole, Walters may very well have established a treasure digging seer reputation, which fell to young Joe Smith when Walters was forced to flee the area due to legal trouble in connection with treasure digging. Walters had significant influence on Smith during his treasure digging days. Walters was steeped in the world of magic and alchemy, knowledge of which helped him establish a successful medicinal emporium and reputation as an eccentric root and yarb doctor. As Walters' alleged protege, it's likely Smith eagerly absorbed the expertise necessary to successfully manipulate and preserve entheogens, as well as tips on proper administration and conducive set and setting techniques. Okay, we've we've gone kind of long with all of this. This has been a lot of material to get through, and we're just getting into the Joseph Smith world of view. And what we're going to do here, I think we're going to call this right now as it sits, because this is just set out the world that Joseph Smith was born into in the, you know, the type of people he considered his mentors. It was a very incestuous type of mindset from the people that he learned these various entheogens and he learned this magic. They were all passing the same books and same publications around. There were many prominent people who Joseph Smith probably revered in his day, but Lumen Walters was obviously one who made more of an impact on Joseph and had the accessible knowledge necessary in order for Joseph Smith to get to this this level of knowledge where he could reliably use these entheogens. So that being said, let's cut this off at part one. There's obviously so much more to get to. We're only a third of the way through our paper here, Cody. Um, but we did spend a lot of time establishing the magic and establishing the prehistory of entheogen use, which is not included in the paper. And I think in part two of it, we're going to really dive into the Joseph Smith section and actual Mormon history, the impact that this stuff had on Mormonism in general. Does that sound good to you, man? I'm happy with that. Let's uh, let's do it. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay. So with that being said, Cody, 
Thank you so much for joining me. And I think you're probably just going to air this, this episode on your podcast feed as well, just so we get the, the cross of people listening on both sides. Yes. So for the people who are listening on Naked Mormonism, can you give everybody the pitch of where to find you and Silly Rabbits and your online presence? Certainly. Um, you can find us at sillyrabbits.com. That's uh, spelled P-S-I-L-L-Y and then rabbits. Um, we find us on Patreon, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of that, uh, under Silly Rabbits. Um, if you want to contact us directly, you can do so at silly.rabbits at gmail.com. And, uh, thanks for listening. Well, thank you for joining me. And for those listeners on Silly Rabbits, uh, you can find a naked Mormonism anywhere by Googling or, uh, typing it into iTunes or Stitcher or your podcasting app of choice, Naked Mormonism, or you can search me on Facebook, Bryce Blankenagel. Sound it out. It is, is spelled exactly how it sounds. And uh, I look forward to uh, to talking to you more about the history of Joseph Smith and entheogen use and the Smith entheogen historical model. With that being said, Cody, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I look forward to talking to you next week about Joseph Smith and actually him using entheogens. The pleasure is all mine, Bryce. Uh, Till next week. And that does it for the conversation on today's episode. Stay tuned for next week to hear the actual Mormon portion of the Sunstone paper, which will be airing just in time for the presentation and the live show. Before finishing up, I know we've gone really long this episode, but that's just kind of the nature of the clean cut episodes. I want to talk for a few minutes about something that came up in conversation with Dan after we had stopped recording. Dan and I spoke on the idea of secular Mormonism and what it means to be Mormon, ex-Mormon, anti-Mormon, or whatever label, fill-in-the-blank Mormon that you claim. Now, these are obviously simplistic labels, but they function for the purposes of what we're about to discuss. Last week, I ranted about how this crusade, this naked Mormonism crusade, isn't against Mormons, it's against Mormonism. I made the point that I have nothing but good to say about Mormons as they are my friends and my family. This crusade, which manifests itself as research-heavy podcasts and the Sunstone presentations and all of the other projects I'm affiliated with, is against a systematic cult which perpetuates lies through the mouths of its unwitting parishioners. And I've always been frustrated with this line, which eh, unfortunately perfectly describes me, but it's used to disparage or insinuate something about somebody who does what I do. And that line is, you can leave the church, but you can't leave it alone. And I've taken issue with that phrase before, but you know, right now I'm beginning to come to grips with it. So let me share my reasoning. Growing up in the church, it was pounded into my brain that I had to view everything in my life through my Mormon lens. Every activity in which I engaged, the question always hung over me, how will this affect my standing in the church or my testimony? Or if I do this thing, am I going to have to talk to my bishop about it? You know, many people leave the church and that's it. They're done with anything Mormonism and they couldn't care less. But for some of us, that need to view everything through the church's eyes doesn't go away once we leave the church. And Realistically speaking, that's the greatest achievement of brainwashing and mind control. But unfortunately for the organization which fosters this totalitarian mindset, that mind control and brainwashing cuts both ways. When some people leave, they can't leave the cult alone because it's so deeply ingrained in every part of their life. This is the reason why I'm slowly shying away from labeling myself as ex-Mormon in lieu of embracing the term secular Mormon. I'm not an ex-Mormon because I I didn't actually leave the church behind me the way that ex-cons or ex-married people leave that chapter of their lives behind them. Mormonism is my culture and I'm a secular humanist. I'm a secular Mormon. When I was talking to Dan about this concept, he said that secular Mormon doesn't really fit him because he's had his name removed from the rolls, whereas I haven't, so the box fits me a little bit better than it does him. But the thought occurred to me, 
isn't embracing the term ex-Mormon because you had your name removed from the rolls just giving undue power to the organization which claims to define what Mormonism is and is not? The Mormon church defines everything members do and even further defines their social status by giving callings. If we leave the church and have our names removed, doesn't calling ourselves ex-Mormon just further allow the church to define who we are? thus furthering its influence on those who've left the cult? Look, the, the Mormon religion in general isn't going anywhere anytime soon. We need to come to grips with that fact. It will continue to ebb and flow, slowly adapting to social pressures, which incite necessary and long overdue change. The only way we can push them to change in ways that are social goods is by being up in their face about how outdated they are on current social issues. For the Mormon church to change, it requires humanist Mormons to drag it, kicking and screaming out of the 1950s and into the 21st century. This brings me to the final goal of the Patreon Pledge Drive Month before Sunstone. This is our magnum opus final goal. This upcoming Saturday's episode of My Book of Mormon features something that Marie and I thought up on the fly and we discussed on the air. We told everybody that if we can get My Book of Mormon podcast the $33 to the next Patreon goal and Naked Mormonism the $49 to the next Patreon goal, we would attend a church together on Sunday morning after the live show. Now, I've had a bit of time since Marie and I recorded to reflect and process this and think about the best way to do it. And the thought occurred to me that none of what Marie and I do is for the money. Money is merely a byproduct of us doing what we love to do. So this approach is all wrong. We shouldn't hold this activity hostage for a few dollars. That's what the church does with temple attendance in heaven. So don't tell Andrew Torres this, but instead of making church the Sunday morning after the live show a Patreon goal, Marie and I are making a terrible business decision, but a fun community decision, and we're going to attend church regardless of whether or not we reach that next Patreon goal. Now, this is just a, a brief side note, and it's relevant, but let me throw some maths your way. To get us up to these goals, it requires about four-fifths of 1% of the Naked Mormonism listeners to sign up at a dollar an episode, or about one-quarter of 1% of the listeners to sign up at the $3 Book of Exaltation level in order to reach that goal. So that's my way of saying we're really, really close to our next goal, and those percentages are even smaller and more easily surmountable to get my Book of Mormon up to the next Patreon goal. Now, it's not easy to ask for money, so instead, for this episode, we're just telling you what we're doing, and if you think that's a good idea aimed at perpetuating a good overall cause, please consider supporting our efforts. Marie and I are going to church on July 30th, regardless of Patreon goals, but if you want to help us get to those goals, it would be really awesome of you, and it won't take much to get us there. That's patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Naked Mormonism and My Book of Mormon Podcast. But back to the main point here. We're sharing the details of our activities on Sunday, July 30th, after the live show, because we're officially rallying the troops. Marie and I are attending the 11 a.m. church session of the 18th Ward, which meets at the Joseph Smith Memorial Building located at 15th East South Temple in Salt Lake City, just right next to Temple Square. And you're all invited. Everyone listening to this is invited. They say that visitors are welcome, so let's test the boundaries of that claim by showing up as a group. Now, just to lay a ground rule, we're going to be respectful. But I have a feeling like we may stand out from the crowd as the average age of people in that ward is like 89 years old. But I'll just say, we can be respectful while at the same time standing out. So I encourage any of you who plan on answering this rally cry by attending with us to wear your rainbow or red savannah ties, rainbow pins or wristbands, and most importantly, let your porn shoulders out. And you may wonder why we chose that ward specifically. Well, for starters, it meets in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, so booyah. And secondly, the 18th and Canyon Wards, which meet there, are the home wards to a bunch of the general authorities and to the Prophet himself. 
It's rare that any of them actually attend these meetings, but there's the smallest inkling chance that an apostle will be up on the stand and look out over our smiling faces and rainbow garb and our porn shoulders. <laughs> Maybe they'll be able to smell the hangover on some of us from the live show the night before. We, you know, who knows? But just to reiterate the ground rule, we aren't there to crash the congregation or disrupt the regular proceedings. We're only there to show them that secular humanist Mormons and even interested nevermos like Marie exist and that we are the younger generation to whom they need to appeal in order to survive the 21st century. We need to stop letting the church define us as Mormon, ex-Mormon, anti-Mormon, apostate, or any other seemingly useful label. We need to define the church. We are secular Mormons. We are a movement that will roll over this multi-billion dollar worldwide corporation and force it into obscurity until it conforms to humanism and disbands its authoritarian rule over the lives of millions of people. Secular Mormons won't leave the church alone after leaving it until Mormonism stops being a mind-controlling cult. Needless to say... Marie and I have job security for the foreseeable future. All right, that's going to do it for our episode today. Be sure to check the show notes for a ton of links that Cody and I referenced, as well as uh, Dan and I discussed in this episode, because these are just the edges of rabbit holes that we've been showing you, and we encourage you to jump down it and do some investigation for yourself. So the show notes of this episode are absolutely loaded with relevant links on the Smith entheogen theory. So please, if you are interested, there's a lot of resources there. That being said, we do have some new patrons to thank. First off, I need to thank Aaron, Alice, Boz, Jeannie, and Greg for new pledges as well as Patreon edits. Thank you all of you so much for pledging to support during our Patreon Pledge Month. The influx of support since we started this has really been helpful, and to everybody who has pledged to support, you're really keeping this alive. You're keeping the, the lights on and the mic on and uh, the computer running, so thank you very dearly to all of you. With that, let's close it down for the night, but before we do, we need to thank a few people for keeping the show going. First off, I need to thank Julie as well as Demonista for running the Facebook and Twitter handles. Thank you for keeping the conversation alive there. I need to thank Craig Keeling for providing the artwork used in the show with his permission. Go to weirdmormonshit.com to see his blog there. Thank you very much to Jason Camo for providing the music used in the show with his permission. Go to alossstateofmind.com to hear more of his music there. Legal services for the show are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Be sure to listen to Opening Arguments podcast to hear Thomas and Andrew discuss atheist and skeptical law topics. Thanks once again to the patrons who keep this show alive, and most importantly, thank you to our imperatively important and wonderfully devoted listeners once again for lending me your ear. Hope to talk at you next time, here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
preceding podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC. Copyright 2017. All rights reserved.